mother of all talk shows is back. Unleashed, unabridged, uncensored, and unbelievable. Only on Sputnik Radio. Listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. This is London, but coming to you, of course, all over the world, thanks to SputnikNews.com. Thanks to the wonders of the internet or the record players, the radiograms in Joe Biden's household. On FM in Washington, D.C., 105.5. On AM across the United States, from coast to coast, on AM radio. And this is a radio show you can even watch on Facebook, on RT UK News Facebook page. And if you are watching on Facebook, Remember the magic words, share, share, share to all of your friends on Facebook. You can even watch it on my YouTube channel, George Galloway Official. It's the mother of all talk shows. It's the open university of the airwaves. There are no tuition fees and you're encouraged to speak back to the teacher. Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a rocky ride on the rodeo. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The world is our classroom and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Well, that was the week that was. It was the week in which Fireman Sam, the much loved children's cartoon character was banished from the force by fire chiefs who thought that he was too white and too male. Nothing wrong with that, I say, as a white male myself in a country where 88% of the people are white and where half of them are males, but it does raise serious concerns for the fate of Noddy, the oldest and most loved of children's characters. Unless Noddy redefines himself as they rather than him or her, in the way that Sam Smith did this week. Now, let me say to Joe Biden, I play Sam Smith on my record player all the time. I think his voice came from God, is simply divine. I have zero interest in his sexuality, and I'm surprised that he thought that we did. Adam, Gary and I were on a long drive this week, coming back from the mother of all talk shows, Roadshow, and we came up with a few cover hits that he might cover for his next album. Thank you for the days, the old Kinks number. Those were the days, my friend. You get where I'm coming from here, or rather headed to. This kind of absurd political correctness is alienating on this side of the Atlantic what has long been underway in the United States of America, where to be in with the in crowd, you've got to know your hymns from your hers and your him and hers from the theys. The firefighter, and by the way, some of my oldest and closest friends are women firefighters, and I'd rather they came to rescue me than Farm and Sam. But firefighters are firefighters. It's not off-putting to women firefighters that Farm and Sam has something in his pants that defines him as a male. It's no more off-putting to young male explorers to enjoy the wonders of Dora the Explorer. If you're listening from far away and don't know any of these characters, perhaps you'll get it if I make this point. Last night, 
I was at a boxing event in Southampton, an overwhelmingly pro-leave area. The audience, as is Southampton, was overwhelmingly white. The audience, as is the normal audience for boxing, was overwhelmingly male. And that's just the way things are. By forcing identity politics, political correctness, the policing of language, the policing of perception of one person of another is doomed to alienate vast tracts of the population. And insofar as the left are identified as the champions of this kind of nonsense, the beneficiaries will be, as they have been in the United States, the political right. Just think about that. It was the week when the walrus, I am the walrus, John Bolton, was finally dismissed. The little egg man who fomented war everywhere, war, famine, pestilence and disease were his middle names. Donald Trump finally decided to give him the boot. After a series of foreign policy disasters with China, with Venezuela, with North Korea, with Syria, and perhaps above all with Iran, Donald Trump's opinion poll ratings are on the slump. Donald, slump it is this week. Another four points of his public opinion poll ratings. Bolton's been given the boot, but he's not the last of the Mohicans in that administration. Pompeo was at it again today when the Yemenis struck back from years of relentless bombardment of their country, its hospitals, its schools, its wedding parties, even the funeral parties burying the people that were killed in the last airstrike. The Yemenis struck back at Saudi Arabia's principal oil terminals and set them on fire, causing a halving of Saudi Arabia's oil production. As Oscar Wilde said on the death scene of Little Nell, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to laugh. So, the Saudis know the Yemenis can fight back. That's what any rational, sane person would say, before going on to say, let's try and bring this war to an end, but not Pompeo. He demanded that the United States find Iran guilty of the drone attacks on the Saudi oil refineries. And Lindsey Graham, who's never seen a war that he didn't like, though not enough to go and fight in it himself, has called for American airstrikes on Iranian oil refineries. Well, Mr. Trump, President Trump, if you do that, then you're an even bigger fool than most people already imagine you to be. And I spoke of Joe Biden earlier. Did you see the debates? Did you see his false teeth shooting out of his mouth and across the debating chamber floor? Did you see him in the previous debate when blood started to come from his eye? The boulder dash between his ears remains intact as his long, utterly incoherent rambles, right-wing reactionary rambles continued to pour out of his mouth even after he lost his false teeth. I'm sorry, Joe, it's time to chuck it, and your family really ought to lead you away before the men and women, and they in white coats come onto the stage and lead you away themselves. Bernie, on the other hand, had another storming week and has broken into a massive lead in the opinion polls in New Hampshire, which has the benefit of being the state that will hold the first 
primary early next year in the Democratic Party process to pick their candidate against Donald Trump. I reiterate my oft-repeated take on this issue. If the Democrats pick Bernie Sanders, they can and will beat Donald J. Trump. If they pick anybody else, and particularly if they pick Joe Biden, they will be annihilated by Donald Trump. Speaking of boxing, the referee will have to intervene and stop the fight. The coaches in the corner will have to throw in the towel. Can you imagine Trump pulverizing that old man, Joe Biden, blood streaming from his eye, his dentures fleeing from his mouth, talking utter nonsense? I shudder at the very thought of it. And it was the week when Brexit went berserk here in Britain. The Liberal Democrats in the last 24 hours have declared themselves to be the opposite of Liberal and definitely the opposite of Democrats. They have passed a policy at their annual conference not to have a second referendum to force the people to keep on voting until they vote the right way. No, that was their policy last week. This week, they're not even going to get a second referendum, just in case they fail to change their mind. The Liberal Democrats now are going to be the party to revoke Article 50 and forget all about this Brexit business altogether. Well, if you believe that, I've got a bridge here in London I can sell you. I spent the last few days in the West Midlands, in Southampton, in a vast auditorium with hundreds and hundreds of working class boxing fans. If you think Brexit's going away, you weren't in the West Midlands with me and you weren't in Southampton with me last night night. But speaking of the West Midlands, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, deputy leader, somebody called Tom Watson, he made a speech this week which directly contradicted his own party of which he is, I remind you, thrice the deputy leader and absolutely contradicted, indeed kicked in the teeth and Corbyn's teeth are real, I hasten to remind you. Not that I've pulled on them or anything, but I know him well enough to know he doesn't have a set of Joe Bidens in his mouth. Tom Watson kicked him in the teeth by saying that Labour should not support a general election for another six months. And in that six months, a second referendum should be held between... Theresa May's Brexit deal, already dead and buried, which Labour under Watson would disinter and put back, mouldering from its grave on the table and have a new referendum between Theresa May's dead Brexit deal and remaining, with him as the deputy leader, Thornberry as the foreign secretary, Macdonald as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Abbott as the Home Secretary, Starmer as the Brexit Secretary, are all pledged to campaign to remain. It's an odd way of living up to the manifesto promise which Labour successfully ran with in just 2017, scoring 40% in the polls. They're now down in the mid-20s at best. But in 2017, they promised to respect the result of the 2016 referendum, to respect the decision of the majority in that referendum, but merely to renegotiate the terms. That's what Corbyn wants to do, but all of his confederates now, all of them, including his closest colleagues, Macdonald and Abbott, who wouldn't get a chance of a sniff of a front bench 
under any leader except Corbyn have joined the gang, the gang that seeks to break Brexit. And in so doing, and maybe for some of them that's the plan, break any possibility of Labour forming a government at an early general election. Because, you see, for many of them, not Macdonald and Abbott, they would rather have Boris Johnson as Prime Minister than have their own leader, Jeremy Corbyn, as one. And, of course, the ghouls are out again today. I see in the Daily Mail that the sources in the British security services have warned Donald Trump that Jeremy Corbyn PM might leak secrets to the Russians. Why? Because he's a lefty? But Russia is not lefty. There's nothing left-wing about Russia. Russia ceased to be a communist country almost 40 years ago. What is wrong with these people? Why would Corbyn leak secrets in the first place? And why would he leak them to Russia? This kind of mania is going to grow and grow. And of course, it is assisted ably and utterly destructively by the fifth column inside the Labour Party as a whole, concentrated in the parliament, in the parliamentary Labour Party, now concentrated in his own shadow cabinet, and even now with Macdonald and Abbott, jumping ships in his own kitchen cabinet, his own inner circle. Which leads me to Boris. The last story and this one confirm my long-held view that Britain is ruled not by James Bonds, but by Austin powers, by Johnny English, by blithering idiots. Boris Johnson not only looks like a cartoon character, but has begun openly to liken himself to one. Today, he was going to break the shackles like the Hulk and come out swinging and fighting for Britain post-Brexit. Uh, but he forgot several things. First of all, that Mark Ruffalo, who plays the Hulk, hates him and was quick to point it out. Secondly, the Hulk is green and not blue. Thirdly, the Hulk is American and not British. And fourthly, and perhaps most importantly, the Hulk has a middle name. Incredible. The Incredible Hulk being played by the incredible Boris Johnson, who is running his campaign. They advised him to prorogue the parliament, to stop the parliament, trussing him up like a turkey and making a fool of him tying his hands in his negotiations with the European Commission and its leaders. So he prorogued the parliament and they trussed him up like a turkey anyway. There was ample time in the non-prorogued parliament to wreck Boris Johnson's Brexit planning. So what was the point of the prorogation? What is the point of these walkabouts in northern towns where it seems people are queuing up to tell them to get out of their town? And I saw today, actually tears rolled down my face with laughter. Boris shambled up to a fortune teller a gypsy fortune teller on a seafront somewhere and asked her what her predictions for the future were without anyone having checked what it was she might say 
as the cameras were rolling, rolling, rolling. Well, her husband said, actually our forecast is for a Labour victory at the general election. And just as Boris rocked back on his heels, he doubled down. He asked the woman, the fortune teller herself, what's your prediction? And she said, you've got a right cheek. You've stolen my pension. You've robbed this town of all prosperity. You've devastated us all with your austerity. And now you're asking for my fortune telling free of charge without even offering a golden coin to pay for it. And then she confirmed her husband's crystal ball that her official prediction was for a Labour victory. Well, there might be and there might not be. It all depends on whether Boris Johnson is as stupid as he looks and is acting. If Boris Johnson makes a pact with Farage and the Brexit party, he will win the general election and win it very handsomely. But he has already rejected such a pact in the most insulting terms. And so the Brexit party will be forced to oppose him in all but a handful of constituencies. In which case it becomes a four-party race in England, a five-party race in Wales and a five-party race in Scotland. In England, all four of the parties will be in the 20 percent and it will therefore be the most unpredictable election in living memory. Actually, since Harold Wilson went to the polls in February of 1974 and won his third of four terms as a Labour Prime Minister. And finally, it was the week when Julian Assange served out what was in any case a grotesquely unfair and long sentence for skipping bail and where the court decided that he must remain in custody, perhaps four years, in Belmarsh Prison, a maximum security jail, until the American case, an explicitly political set of charges of revealing American official secrets, Julian must continue to waste, waste away in Belmarsh Prison. Well, not if I can help it. I am absolutely committed to devoting as much of my time as I conceivably can to get Julian Assange out of jail. And I'll be interviewing his father by Skype right after this. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors 
From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Big thanks to SputnikNews.com, Sputnik Radio, well worth putting on your radio menu. And to RTUK Facebook page also for hosting the filming of this show tonight. It's also on my YouTube channel, George Galloway Official. If you're watching on Facebook, please, please share it with all of your friends on Facebook. Now, John Shipton is a fine man, an Australian. I actually had the honour of meeting and spending time with him in Australia a few years ago when I visited Sydney on a speaking, a small speaking tour. I never imagined when I met him some five years ago now that I'd still be having to talk to him, this time over the phone, alas, about the vile incarceration of his son, Julian Assange, and I hope he's joined me now on the line. John, are you there? Yes, yes. Hi, George. Hi, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. I said in my introduction that the decks are now cleared. Nobody has any excuse, if excuse there was, to support the incarceration of your son Julian. There are no charges in Sweden. The investigation into him there was long ago dropped. He's not in prison for having skipped bail. He's in prison for political charges. So, as uh, uh, Ambassador Craig Murray put it today, Britain now holds the world's number one political prisoner. Am I right? Yes, uh, uh, Julian has done nothing wrong. Not uh, the uh, British judiciary has uh, pursued him. Uh, judge Philip, the first one, uh, his his uh, judgment severely criticised by the uh, Cambridge Law Review. Uh, judge Arbus not in her hysterical denunciation, saying he ought to get a bit of sun and step onto the veranda occasionally. Judge Phillips, it, uh, who uh, I suppose had a law degree but became a, a psychiatrist uh, and gave a psychological evaluation rather than a judgment. And today, yesterday, the other day, Judge Barita, who uh, decided to hear a, a bail application case which wasn't before her, which she uh, promptly uh, refused. <laughs> Who brought um, that bail application? It wasn't Julian's legal team. No, the, the, she made, the Judge Barrett uh, made it herself. <laughs> so she adjudicated <laughs> on a bail application that nobody made. Yes, yes. She made it up herself and then consequently refused it. It's <laughs> utterly farcical. And she made the point that Julian's Calvary of all those years inside that embassy and now the requisite part of a 12-month sentence has cost the British taxpayer, taking into account the police costs and so on, 
16 million pounds. And so he must stay in Belmarsh and run up a bill, depending on how long the case lasts, of many times 16 million pounds. Why? Well, you know, the, I, I have no idea I, I, why the, the British judiciary is so uh, seething with resentment of Julian is, is a question I can't answer. I can't answer it either, and I'm British, and I have followed and studied this case in such great detail. It is an animus not even matched in the United States. There's a huge debate going on in the United States, in the media, in the political class, about the justice of extraditing Julian Assange in the first place. But in Britain, there's no debate at all. He's being no. held now only for the Iraq war logs and the Afghan war logs, which were a signal service to the world, revealing war crimes without number. And everyone who read those stories, everyone who published those stories, ought to be on the street with a Julian Assange banner. But they're not. The, the, yeah, George, the, uh, those officials are in, uh, who are engaged in administering the destruction of Iraq and Afghanistan occasionally pop up saying that uh, Julian endangered lives, which he didn't, which is just a plain lie. But their obscenity of these officials involved in the murder of a million and a half people saying that this innocent man has been now restricted in freedom, the further restrictions, now solitary confinement, endangered lives. It's just beyond obscenity. No description for it. You're right. Have you been able to see Julian in the prison? Yes, I, I went uh, three months ago um, and uh, he, he wasn't, he, you know, not in good order, but fighting fit, uh, but uh, you know, suffering from torture, as Nils Melzer outlined. Um, he was the United Nations man, yeah? Yes, yeah. Uh, rapporteur on torture, uh, went and visited the prison with two experts who uh, know how to look at a victim who's been tortured, a person who's been tortured, and uh, he made a, a conclusion which was published, which the, the British government derided and said, oh, well, we're ignoring that. Similarly, the same way they uh, ignored the WIGAD, uh, the United Nations uh, Committee on uh, Arbitrary Detention. They similarly, when that the declared that Julian was arbitrarily detained, they said, oh, well, we're not taking any notice of that. Well, uh, um, the Honourable uh, former Ambassador Craig Murray uh, pointed out some, something on that today of really momentous importance and which should cause all British so-called journalists to hang their head in shame. This very committee of the UN set up to uh, highlight cases of unjust and arbitrary uh, incarceration, detainment of people, actually made a very forthright denunciation of the Iranian imprisonment of a British woman, a mother of small children, uh, who is being unjustly held in Iran without proper trial, but the British media could not report that. Why? Oh. Because the yeah. same committee had said the same thing about your son Julian, and they could not report a UN demand that Nazanin be, re be released from Iran because that same committee, so far as the British media w was concerned, didn't exist, couldn't be allowed to exist, because if it did, you'd draw attention to their forthright demand for the release of Julian Assange. How about that? Oh, that's just extraordinary. In February, they did a further review 
and uh, launched a, another uh, severe criticism of the British government, which was uh, ignored. In fact, the B British government participated in uh, the dragging of Julian from the embassy against all conventions. Indeed, they did. Now, uh, bad uh, as my own government is, what about your government? Julian is an the Australian citizen. What has the Australian government, and public for that matter, done about one of their, uh, one of their sons being the, uh, treated in this way? For the most part, they sit on their hands uh, and uh, they are complicit in their silence. I must say just in that uh, uh, Julie Bishop raised the matter at parity with Jeremy Hunt and with Pompeo when she was uh, foreign minister. That's the only time that the matter's been raised. And is it uh, uh, an issue in Australia, in the print, in the broadcasting, no. in, in the political class at all? No. In the political class, yes, but in, in the media, it's homogenous uh, like the rest of the Western world. Mm. And they only, only uh, take opportunity to report when uh, they have to. And uh, when you saw Julian, uh, did he, was he aware uh, of the campaign around the world uh, trying to free him? How isolated do you think he feels in there? Does he know what's uh, happening in the world? No, nothing. He's in his cell for 22 hours a day and uh, uh, he goes to the Catholic Mass, which is three times a week, so that he can mix with other prisoners. Otherwise, he would be in his cell for 23 hours a day. It's just... And no, no internet? No internet, no. Li I think he got one one library visit so far in the time he's been there. One library and visit. No internet. One library yes. visit in what is effectively what seven, eight months of jail. Yes, yes, and, and no opportunity whatsoever to prepare for Judge Barates's, uh condemnation that you'll abscond. Nothing. There's just nothing. Well, uh, I mean, yes, the, uh, the, the way it's going, uh, the British government will be conducting both sides of the case. Uh, they'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll be putting up the arguments for Julian in order that they themselves can knock them down. Yes, uh, as, as, as Baraita did. That's Where, an you know, story, just I must say. Think, they just think up things in the night and bring them to court. And will there be an actual bail application? Can there now yes. be? by Julian's defence team? Of course they'll make an application. They don't want Julian... I mean, he's already been incarcerated for nine years. This case will probably go for three years. That would be 12 years. For God's sake, the cruelty. It's just awful. 12 years, and they can't consider a bail application. The only bail application they consider is the, the ones they make themselves. Extraordinary. And, uh, I mean, finally, I mean, how, in a way, it's, uh, I'm not sure even how to ask it, but how does it affect you? How does it affect his mother? How does it affect his children, his siblings? I mean, what's the, you've been all serving this sentence too, haven't you? Well, his his mother is, uh, I mean, you know, struggles with it and fights furiously. Um, his his children can't see him. Uh, his brother gets to see him once a year. His sister hasn't seen him at, at all. Um, and I come, you know, as frequently uh, as possible. I come every Christmas and I spend Christmas with him. Um, which is a uh, joyful but you know a bit of a strain on both of us i've um, got i've got uh, a couple of questions here that uh, viewers and listeners are sending in john yes. uh, george could yes. you ask john please this is from dan could you ask john please about satoshi nakamoto i don't know what that is who that is but you may 
That's the man who uh, put together Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, ah. he's, Yeah, he's the originator of Bitcoin. Uh, I, that's all I know about Satoshi. Okay. And Bird he's of Paradise, of, is, a, is he a friend of Julian? Yes, he, back in uh, 2010 they were corresponding. Uh, Bird of Paradise, hello to Julian Assange's father. Your son is a great man. Hope you're doing well, sir. Well, I think we all well, can say that uh, with our hands on our heart, John. We hope that you all survive this trial uh, in every sense, literal and figurative. And your son is a great man. I have the honor uh, to be a friend of his and to know him well and know his greatness well. Uh, and I hope that that is at least a scant consolation to you that people all over the world recognize your son as a great man. Thank you. Thank you, George. I'm quite moved by that. Thank you. May God bless you. Thank you very much indeed for coming Thank on you. the mother of all talk shows. I'll be back right after this break. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful uh, water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Hellos from South Africa, Spain, the United States of America, Pakistan, the Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, Germany, and Canada. Is that all, Elena? No other countries? Let's get... If you're listening anywhere else, let us know, will you, please? Tweets from Alistair Robertson. At the present moment, you're just going to have to accept that Northern Ireland, along with the rest of the UK, voted to leave the EU under the auspice of the UK. You might not be happy with that, but what are you going to do? Well, there's not much, Alistair, that I can do, but the Irish people can. And as you very well know, the majority of people in the six counties of the occupied north of Ireland voted to remain in the EU. I think they're wrong so to have voted, uh, but they did vote that way. So um, rejoice, rejoice. A very simple solution, therefore, presents itself. As the Republic of Ireland strongly supports and claims that it strongly benefits from uh, membership of the EU and the majority of people in the six counties of the north of Ireland voted to remain in the EU, well, the solution is obvious, Alistair. They could reunify their country and all of them could enjoy, if that's the word, membership of the European Union 
as long as it lasts, which might not be as long as you think. Stuart Elson says, looks like it took Labour 45 minutes to come up with their latest Brexit plan. You need a, a cryptographer to fully uh, actually interpret it. Roger Watson says, George, don't tell me that you think communism is good for people. Not sure what that question is even supposed to mean, Roger. I haven't mentioned communism at all in the course of this show. Fra Hughes says, as a fan of Corbyn, I cannot but feel he has delegitimized democracy by moving Labour into a second referendum stroke Remain party. I wouldn't vote for Labour this side of Brexit. Well, I'm not sure it's him that's moved. I think it's him that's been moved. Uh, his uh, uh, allies, <laughs> shall I call them that, he said laughingly, uh, have got their hands round his throat and have dragged him to wherever it is he is today, which isn't necessarily where the Labour Party is going to be tomorrow. Uh, it's uh, people in motion, as Scott McKenzie used to say on my record player, Joe. Uh, Jude says the English lied to the Scots in 2014. Let me just deconstruct that one, Jude. The English lied to the Scots in 2014. Did any of you through there lie to the Scots in 2014? Any of you English in there lie to the Scots? Wait a minute, I'm Scots. None of them lied to me. No English people lied to me in 2014, at least as far as I recall. The promise didn't even, what are you talking about, Jude? You hopeless cause. To Troy Astro says, I'm sick of hearing of Brexit. It will never pass. Well, a lot of people are sick of hearing uh, of it, Troy. But until we get Brexit behind us, instead of forever in front of us, there will be no normal politics in this country. There'll be no Labour, Tory, no right, left, no taxation spending, not, none of the normal politics that we have lived with, most of us, all of our lives will be possible until this dichotomy, leave, remain, is resolved. And it can only be resolved by the implementation of the verdict that was given by the people in 2016. Wolfie Smith, power to the people, says, what's going on with your monologue, George? I thought you were a socialist. Wolfie, what does that even mean? mean? What does it mean? Unless you're referring to Fireman Sam, are you? Do you think it's socialist to ban Fireman Sam because he's too white and too male? Do you? Do you think it's socialist to go around offending the English language by demanding that people refer to a singular as a plural? Is that what you mean? by socialism, Wolfie? I suspect it is actually. I suspect you think that socialism is liberalism, is identity politics, is sex, gender, race, anything but class, anything but the real class issues. The issue between the rich and powerful and the poor and powerless. That's the only identity politics in which I am interested. Wolfie, if you didn't mean any of that, do, please, call us. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Sami Ansari says, George, only you can expose the conspiracies against the humanity in the parliament. Thank you, Sami, for that. Alexander says, Assange rots in prison while Blair roams free. Not just free, Alexander. He's far from free. He's exceedingly expensive, in fact. He's amassed a hundred million pound personal fortune since leaving office just a decade or so ago. Go figure. Just think about that. Michelle Churchland says, the British legal system is so corrupt. Hashtag free. Julian Assange. And Reeve Sleeveth 
says the UK is a warmongering totalitarian state with a veil of tolerance and democracy. Let's take a caller. We've got time. We've got time, Elena. Let's go to Pennsylvania and talk to Jared. Jared, welcome. Hello, George. I, I just got back from my vacation in uh, Gettysburg. It was a lovely time visiting the battlefield there. There was just so much history. It was, it was just great. I'd love to we do that, yes. I'd love to do that. Oh, it, it was absolutely great. Of course, um, Lincoln, uh, all... of course Lincoln uh, and the Union uh, defeated the racists there and then set off to the West to massacre hundreds of thousands of Native Americans. We mustn't forget that. Yes, that's, that's sort of the uh, big irony of, uh, of uh, all of, um, of uh, um, our history was that, that, that great moment when, we, when Lincoln used the Gettysburg Address to issue the Emancipation Proclamation to liberate all the slaves in the rebel territories only for us to go forward and um, colonize the West and along with um, overseas territories um, all around the world. Yep. And, um, yeah. And, but it was, it was a good, good experience. Oh, though. sure, sure. I hope, to, of, I hope to do it one day. Anyway, how, did, how do you think the debates went this week? Um, the debates, ABC, um, these debates are truly horrible. You can see the bias um, by the, um, uh, you call them fifth columnists in your country for uh, the Blairites. I call them Vichy Dems, like uh, Vichy France for yeah. uh, Nazi Germany. Yeah. That's what I call uh, the... The people opposing Bernie Sanders in this um, primary, because they, they didn't ask Bernie almost any questions. And when they did, it was about Venezuela, um, a, a, a claiming that uh, um, Maduro is a, a dictator, uh, not true. They didn't like Bernie's answer, but he didn't take the bait by calling him a dictator. He called him a tyrant, but I... I thought that was a bad answer. I thought it was a mistake on Bernie's part, but he didn't take the bait. Um, and it, it, it seems like that we're red baiting him. And yeah, he, you have he should, all... You know, uh, let me tell you something, Jared. I'm very rarely on what they laughingly call mainstream uh, television anymore. I don't care. I've got my own radio and television platforms. But uh, long before they stopped inviting me, I took the view that whatever the question was, I was going to give my answer, the answer that I had turned up at the TV studio to give. So if they sought to red bait me, my answer would bear no relationship to the question because I had come to the studio to deliver messages one, two, and three. And that's what Bernie Sanders should do. That's what Donald Trump does, and that's what won him the presidential election. Yes, yes, I agree 100%. I, I would it, have it, said, it's... never mind Venezuela, what about U.S. servicemen that are planning to kill themselves because they cannot afford a $140,000 bill for medicine and medical treatment for which they're not insured? Never mind Venezuela, let's talk about America. That's what I would have said if I was Bernie Sanders. Uh, Oh, I agree. I, th I wouldn't have answered any of the questions. I thought the whole thing was propaganda. Mm. I would have brought up the fact that uh, Trump blew up a peace deal with the Taliban, and that war is never going to end. It's on its 18th year. And I know for a fact, because I had a brother who was over in um, uh, uh, Jalalabad, Afghanistan, so just last year, so I know for a fact it's, it's very much still going on, and it's, it's still well, I uh, think, raging. I think it was John Bolton uh, that blew up. We'll see if Trump reinflates yeah. it again. Jared, many thanks for the call. I've got to go to Peter in Manchester, Manchester, England, I'm guessing. Peter. Yes, hello, George. Hello. Yes, go yeah, ahead, sir. I would like, 
Yes, I, I would. I, I'm a bit fed up with the criticism of Trump. Uh, I would say that is, it, it showed it showed a certain maturity in hiring John Bolton, even if he didn't have, uh, share the same beliefs as Bolton. As long as he had something to bring to the table, he hired him. And when he wasn't any good anymore, it showed decisiveness in fi in, fi in firing him. Okay, go on. Uh, well, I, 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 it, was a, it, was your, it was your opinion I was, I was, I was after. Oh, I yeah. wanted to know, do, do you believe... Do you no, believe I, that I, are... I, I think anyone who employs John Bolton is showing not uh, maturity, but imbecility. Because absolutely no good can come from employing John Bolton and Elliot Abrams and Mike Pompeo. They are dedicated to the absolute opposite of what Donald Trump campaigned on in the presidential election and won on yeah. in the presidential election. Uh, Trump said, and I believe him, I believe him, by the way, that he doesn't want America to be going around the world making war, nation building, occupying other countries. Uh, but Bolton and Pompeo, that's their meat and drink, Peter. Yes, 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 I believe. Do you, uh, just, do, do, just one more thing. Do you believe there are powers in the Democratic Party that would rather have Trump serve a second term than Bernie Sanders get the, get the nomination? I, I think almost all of the Democratic Party establishment are in that boat. Almost all of them. And that's why they're rigging uh, this system before it's even begun. Uh, the, reason <laughs> why, the reason why there's a list of Democratic hopefuls as long as your arm it's not because the Democratic Party is bursting with, uh, with talent, as we saw in the debates. It's because they need to force a second ballot at the convention. If there were only two candidates, two or even three candidates, somebody might win on the first ballot at the convention, and they can't have that. Why? Because only in the second ballot do their so-called superdelegates where uh, every member of the Democratic establishment has a, a shed load of votes in their pocket that they can then uh, deploy. So, yeah, uh, my answer to that one is definitely in the affirmative, Peter. Thanks very much indeed uh, for the call. You can call whatever your point of view. If it disagrees with me, it'll be prioritized. If it's a woman caller, it'll be prioritized. A first-time caller prioritized, except, except if you are a legend. If you're one of the designated legends, your call goes straight to the front of the queue. You can also, as you've seen, tweet me at George Galloway, at GG Motes, at RTUK. And you can even Skype us at GG Motes if you want to send a Skype message to us. But above all, I need your calls, either on the US number or on the UK number. If you've enjoyed the first hour and you're watching on Facebook, spread the word, share, share, share. If you're listening on the radio, go and make a cup of tea now, but be back in good time for the second hour of the mother of all talk shows. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Hi, this is Max Kaiser. I'm with Stacey Herbert, and we're doubling down. Yeah, we're doubling down on crazy. We're doubling down on our new show called Double Down on Sputnik. It's doubling down on absolute joyous radio nirvana. You will love it. You will want to listen to every single episode on Sputnik. Bye, y'all. <laughs> You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country. What's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us? Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com.
Every day we ask questions. How is Facebook going to prevent suicides? Well, do you see this as being a human rights violation? Are the cows really stinking up the planet that much? To move ideas forward. A gravitational wave is a ripple in the fabric of space and time. I don't think the uh, launch of the satellite uh, proves anything at all. Where do good ideas come from? We connect with independent thinkers, hear their ideas, and create stimulating debates on real issues. The Dow is uh, in a correction. As I said, commodities across the globe are collapsing. Why is that the case? Because we are in a global recession. That is set to change uh, because Iran has approximately about 50 million barrels, uh, which it had put in storage uh, during uh, the height of the uh, sanctions uh, regime. And uh, that's uh, ready to be released uh, as soon as possible. Where is the money? The super rich individuals and the world's biggest companies are able to hide money in tax havens. Is there a solution to the crisis? No, because I don't think anything useful has come out of any of the policy just reform discussions with respect to financial reform. They give us answers we aren't always prepared for. What are the chances that the report would make Israeli authorities to review their policies towards the Palestinians? Oh, probably zero. <laughs> this recession will be even worse than it was in 2008. But that would be the nasty way for it to happen, you know. But because of Guantanamo, the U.S. is no longer taking so many prisoners. So instead of taking prisoners, they kill people. A lot of people think that he's now unelectable and a bad leader. Wow, there's just so much information to take in. Pay attention, there'll be a test on this later. <laughs> <laughs> taking notes. Welcome to the show. Wow, this is crazy. We're definitely talking sci-fi over here from 20 years ago. People would never have believed this. Crazy times we're living in. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this story. This is a fantastic story. Um, <laughs> yes, it is a fantastic story, and it's a worldwide problem. Welcome to the party. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. You are watching the mother of all talk shows, the Open University of the Airwaves, the College of Knowledge, and it won't cost you a penny. You don't even have to listen to many, if any, capitalist messages. We were talking in the first hour about, well, everything, if you take into account my monologue, but you were also, uh, of course, uh, treated to calls from the United States and from England on the issue of John Bolton and the US uh, presidential elections. But I'm joined now uh, by uh, a very, very interesting man indeed. His name is Ron Unz. He turns out to be even more interesting than I thought that he was. Let me give you his background. He's a theoretical physicist by training. He serves as founder and chairman of UNS.org, a content archiving website. Uh, he was for six years the publisher of the American Conservative, a small opinion magazine. He ran for office in California uh, when he launched a surprise Republican primary challenge to the incumbent governor, Pete Wilson, and his campaign platform was a pro-immigrant platform. And against the prevailing political sentiment, he received 34% of the vote. He'll be joining us uh, shortly, uh, some difficulties getting him on the line. So let me continue through the, the tweets that are uh, flooding in. Remember, uh, to at everyone involved, certainly at George Galloway, at RTUK. Uh, but also it would be helpful if it was a, a, at GG Motes uh, also. Um, now, where did I get to? I got to Reeve uh, Sleeveth. Yeah, here's one for Ask Adam. Adam, I'm uh, doing this one now so you get an hour to think about it before you uh, 
join me. Uh, is there any EU law that Boris and Co can exploit to exit whatever, whatever happens on the 31st of October? I am joined now by my guest, uh, born uh, into, uh, fascinatingly, a Yiddish-speaking household, a man of the right that is pro-immigration, a Jewish man who publishes Professor Norman Finkelstein, a Republican, a conservative, who gets over a third of the vote in California on a pro-immigrant platform. What's not to want to interview? Ron Unz is on the line now, I hope. Ron, are you there? I'm right here. I'm so glad that you could join us. I was anxious there when uh, our first phone call uh, didn't uh, get through. Let me ask you, to get this out of the way, because I'm already getting some chaff uh, on it. Uh, you're Jewish, grew up in a Yiddish-speaking household. You publish Norman Finkelstein, but according to Wikipedia, you're an anti-Semite. What's that all about? Well, I mean, to be honest, Wikipedia is not the most reliable source. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. And, yeah. Right. And to be honest, I, I didn't grow up in a Yiddish-speaking household. My mother grew up in a Yiddish-speaking household. So, mm. you know, I, I basically learned, you know, speaking English from a young age. Yeah. Now, so there's, uh, you're not anti-Semitic. Well, I wouldn't probably say so. <laughs> Yeah, because that's what people are saying. Why are you interviewing an anti-Semite? Well, uh, in the CV that I have, there's no reference to the fact that you're an anti-Semite. And I'm guessing that's because you are not one. Well, I, again, it's not really something that's ever been characterized by me in you know, the media. And I mean, to give you an example, uh, it was about uh, 15 or 20 years ago, I actually covered, I uh, published the uh, lead cover story in Commentary, which is the main publication of the American Jewish Committee. And there also was a very nice uh, profile cover story of me in the New Republic, which, you know, is really a very heavily Jewish publication. So at least that was never the perception that I had from those sorts of sources. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's press on to uh, what it was I really wanted to talk to you about, because uh, my eye was caught uh, by the clarity, uh, but also I think the bravery uh, of your coverage of the uh, Epstein affair, uh, which uh, flowered briefly here in Britain when the Ghislaine Maxwell angle became known, uh, but has uh, long now been uh, buried, presumably uh, with uh, Jeffrey Epstein himself. Uh, is this still a thing in the United States? Are people still talking about how it came to pass that uh, the most interesting prisoner in the American prison system managed to commit the worst case of suicide anybody had ever seen? Well, it's still getting a little bit of discussion and conversation, but to be honest, the media seems to be very eager to bury the whole case, you know, for you know, a variety of reasons, some of which may be, you know, less than honest. And it's certainly, you know, a very embarrassing situation. The fact that the media essentially covered up Epstein's activities for 25 years. Mm. I mean, uh, to be honest, when I'd sometimes seen some mentions of Epstein on the Internet, I sort of assumed it was just Internet nonsense. I mean, it really sounded in his activities something like a James Bond supervillain. And it just seemed to me very implausible that the American media would have covered up such activities if they were real. And then suddenly there were all these stories about him on the front page of the New York Times repeating exactly the items that I'd never believed in. In other words, somebody having a private island, the largest mansion in New York City, stocked with underage girls that he provided to all of these very, very wealthy and famous people, including, for example, Prince Andrew. It just sounded too implausible to be remotely real. And then suddenly it was all on the front page of the New York Times. Yes, uh, the very uh, circles that would have denounced the writings that you refer to on the Internet as conspiracy theories. 
But it, it turns out not only were these conspiracy theories actually true, uh, but that the media that would have called them conspiracy theories covered them up. Exactly, exactly. And the thing is, a lot of the articles I've been writing over the last couple of years deal exactly with that point. The massive volume of media cover-ups and media suppressions of enormously important stories in recent years and, to be honest, recent decades. And basically, there's a clear pattern of this sort of thing. And it seems to me the most important thing we should really take away from the Jeffrey Epstein case is the fact that the media, the Western media, is extremely unreliable. And we just have to be very, very careful before we believe any of its reports on a whole range of touchy and controversial issues. And so, is, is, that uh, why, know, is that why you've gone basically back to being a, a publisher yourself? Uh, on the, and that's, I must tell you, on a, a very much smaller scale than you, uh, that's exactly what I have done. I see no virtue or purpose in, uh, in sending out press releases to what calls itself the mainstream media, uh, because they'll ignore them, cover them up, and insofar as they ever publish anything, they'll distort and twist uh, the uh, points that are being made. So uh, is that what you're doing with the UNS report? Uh, that, that's exactly correct. In other words, I started the UNS review a few years ago for exactly that reason, I mean, really primarily to provide a potential venue for my own writings. But I realized that so many prominent writers, people of really tremendously high caliber, had been purged from the mainstream media over the years, mm. that there was a uh, potential opportunity to provide a useful platform for all of those individuals, uh, individuals from the left, individuals from the right, individuals from a more libertarian direction, individuals whose ideological views can't easily be characterized. But in all those cases, because they stood for views that the media did not like, they were purged from their traditional sources. And it really would be very useful to offer them a combined platform. And also, the truth is, on a lot of these controversial issues, Many individuals who normally would be characterized as being on the right sometimes find themselves quite close to individuals who would be characterized as being on the left. And that's because many of them are willing to stand up for what they feel is the truth rather than bend with the prevailing winds that, you know, well, many times uh, uh, determine what the media says. Yeah, one such case, uh, I've just been talking before you, on the show to uh, John Shipton, the father of Julian Assange. He's another case in point, isn't he? Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, someone who was once uh, the toast of uh, the celebrity uh, leftist uh, glitterati, chatterati classes, uh, and then was dropped like a hot brick and now languishes in Belmarsh prison. Now, indisputably, for the Iraq war blogs and the Afghan war blogs. He has no other charges, only those. And no one, not even the deep state in the US, claims that what he published was untrue. So he's in prison and has been uh, without liberty for almost a decade for publishing that which was true. Now that, that's exactly correct. In other words, we have somebody, just as you say, who was really lionized by the media and the liberal establishment around the world for a few years, and then suddenly they all turned against him, mm -hmm. simply because he continued to hew to the truth rather than to follow you know, the prevailing uh, tides of elite opinion. And it's really, I mean, there are so many cases like that, that the volume, uh, once somebody starts digging into the history of the media and the number of prominent individuals over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years who've been purged from the media on grounds, on ideological grounds, it really becomes a shocking tale. And, and sometimes, for example, the media switches positions. In fact, in your country, I was just uh, looking at that uh, 
earlier this morning. Uh, for example, a, a, a fairly prominent leftist figure in the Labour Party of Britain, Ken Livingston, who you know I've been reading about for many, many years, in fact, who goes back decades, a couple of years ago was purged from the Labour Party simply for pointing to the existence of the Nazi Zionist economic partnership of the 1930s. And that's a perfectly documented, well-known historical fact that, in fact, was reported in the, in the Times of London. Mm. And so when somebody simply quotes the Times of London from the 1980s, but does so in, the, in 2015 or 2016, He's denounced by the media and purged from the Labour Party, which is just completely ridiculous. Yes, and of course, if you had all night, I could give you uh, dozens of uh, other similar stories. But Mr. Livingston was the first and he was the most prominent victim uh, of this witch hunting of people for telling what no one can dispute as the truth. You might argue about the good taste of raising something. You might argue uh, about the political efficacy of raising something uh, in this time at that platform. You can argue all that. But none of these warrants uh, the actual expulsion and the extinguishing of your political identity because what you said was true. Exactly, exactly. And reported by the Times of London. I mean, you can't get a more establishmentarian source than exactly. Britain's most famous newspaper. Yes, uh, it's not quite what it was, Ron, I've got to tell you. But uh, yes, you're right. In the, in the uh, past, it was the Journal of Record. Uh, speaking of records and record players, uh, is, is it really serious that Joe Biden, with his teeth flying out across the debating hall and blood coming from his eye and talking in the arcane uh, uh, language of the 1970s that he seems now still to live in, is he really going to be Donald Trump's uh, opponent uh, come the election? And if he is, Trump's going to romp home, isn't he? Well, it's difficult to say what will happen in the Democratic primaries. I mean, there's obviously a lot of time to go. And I, I think there's a reasonably good chance that a couple of the other candidates, like, for example, Bernie Sanders or uh, Elizabeth Warren, might end up getting the nomination. But, I mean, certainly Biden is one of the, uh, you know, is right now ahead in the polls. So there's certainly a good chance that he'd be the opponent. And if he is, I think I tend to agree with you that Trump would have a much easier time against him than against, you know, one of the other candidates. Solve this conundrum for us, Ron. You're a very intelligent man. You, your IQ is reportedly 214. Uh, and I left school at, at 17 to go and work in the Michelin tire factory. So help me with this. Who is the real Donald Trump? Is, is it the Donald Trump who campaigned for election? as a man who was going to reindustrialize the Rust Belt, was going to end America's involvement in unjust wars, uh, was going to stop being, quote-unquote, nation builder, was going to reset relations with Russia. And is that the real Donald Trump? Uh, and was it that Bolton and co. Uh, prevented the real Donald Trump from uh, coming forward? in which case presumably we'll see a different Donald Trump in the next 12 months. Uh, who is the real Donald Trump in your view? Is he left? Is he right? Uh, is he stupid? Is, he, is there method in his apparent madness? Well, I've never personally met him, but my strong impression of him is that the real Donald Trump is sort of a celebrity type and a fairly ignorant celebrity. In other words, if you took some television celebrity and suddenly gave them enormous political power, they probably wouldn't really know what to do with it. Mm. And they'd probably end up relying on various different advisors who temporarily won their opinion on something. So I, I think the problem is, when Donald Trump ran for office, I don't think he really had a very good idea of what he wanted to do. And as he then came in, his original advisors, who had one set of views, were very quickly purged by the Washington, D.C. establishment. And some of them, in fact, are facing prison sentences right now. And so they were then replaced by advisors who were really 
much closer to the neocon Republican Party that Donald Trump had run against. In yeah. other words, many of the things Donald Trump has been doing in office are exactly the things he denounced the establishment Republican Party for supporting when he defeated them in the primaries. Indeed so, yeah. And it, and it isn't clear to me whether Donald Trump even recognizes that he's changed his views on those issues. I mean, uh, some people have clearly defined political beliefs. Other people don't really pay much attention to politics. And I think Donald Trump falls into that second category. And, you know, it's easy for someone like that to be moved around by whomever they happen to be most recently listening to. Uh, was it Bernard Shaw who said that someone was a sofa who bore the impression of the last person to sit on them? <laughs> uh, I'm, not, not, I'm not making any allegations about people sitting on Donald Trump. I quickly add, what about you now, Ron? Have you given up running for office? You did pretty well when you did run. Oh, well, actually, that was a long time ago. And the thing is, I, I was very concerned at that point over the direction the California Republican Party was taking on immigration issues. And as it is, uh, you know, I, I think I played a role in helping to sort of avert some of that. And as it is, things really worked out quite well in California. And California right now is doing probably better than most other parts of the country. So. You know, I, I think domestically, America has severe economic problems right now. But my main concern is really on the foreign policy side with really what amounts to an insane foreign policy in most recent administrations and really in many ways con continued by Donald Trump and aimed against Russia, aimed against China, aimed against J Iran. And, uh, you know, things like that could get mm. very, very dangerous for the world if they're continued. And that's why, to be honest, I was very willing to support Donald Trump, not because I was tremendously impressed with him personally, but because it seemed to me at the time that Hillary Clinton and some of her views about a military intervention in Syria mm. against the Russian tr troops there were potentially extremely dangerous for the world. So, I mean, the best you can say about Donald Trump is he hasn't actually started a major war yet, and he's been in office for a couple of years. Well, that's right. And I just hope that continues. Well, uh, I put it at the time, having predicted, I may say, that Trump would win, uh, that I'm not happy that Donald Trump is the president, but I'm very happy that Hillary Clinton isn't. And I think uh, that's been borne out by the lack of uh, a war making by Trump uh, over uh, the. The, the first part, at least, of his first term, maybe his only term. Ron, how do people uh, read your stuff? It's uh, the UNS Review, is it? Exactly. Uh, it's basically UNS.com. It's uh, a website that provides a very wide range of alternative perspectives, both from the left and the right, and from really views that don't fit in one way or the other. And, uh, you know, in a sense, we really have gotten quite a lot of traffic over the last few years. And in fact, we've uh, passed now uh, the nation and the new republic in terms of daily readership, which is just astonishing. Mm. I never would have expected when we got started. Well, I'm going to look at it tonight when I get home. I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching will do the same. Pleasure to make your acquaintance, Ron. Thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let's take a break. Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. I'm Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. Tune in. Well, maybe mention, maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you were saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. They are. Everyone's crazy. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com. Global Higher Education, with one of the world's best-known iconoclasts, the mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway.
in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country. What's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us? Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, Progressive Democrats of America, PD, America Tata Org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Ali and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Yes, join the debate. Call, tweet, message me in any way that you can. And as I say, if you want to have an argument with me about any of my own positions that I have enunciated tonight, you'll be prioritized. If you want to raise a different issue, if you want to uh, agree with me, of course, you're equally uh, welcome. But uh, uh, hostile callers are prioritized. I want to make that clear. Let's take Nicholas in France. He wants to talk about the United States and Iran, I think. Nicholas in France, welcome. Thank you very much, George. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Anytime. Uh, big listener, by the way. Big listener. Thank you, sir. So basically what I wanted to ask you is the situation with your government, the UK government, who is basically, you know, carving up to the US once again. The UK pretends to uh, stick to the Iran deal, but at the same time they've seized their cargo from Iran, a tanker, and now they're ready to give it to the US. So basically they're once again lining up with the US to try to create tensions in the Middle East. So what's your take on that? I mean, is it again uh, the U.S., uh, well, the uh, U.K. being slaves of the U.S.? I, that? I, I think it's uh, a little more complicated than that, uh, Nicholas. Let me explain why. But I should enter the caveat that Britain currently doesn't have a government. It certainly doesn't have a government with a foreign policy. The British government has no majority in the parliament and is fixated uh, on one issue only, the issue of Brexit and relations thereafter with the European Union. So I myself would imagine that uh, Boris Johnson has not for a single day since he became Prime Minister thought about our foreign policy for the future. This is an Austin Powers government that is stumbling uh, from uh, crisis to crisis and trying to have a general election which it is not being allowed to have, and so on. But why I say it's a bit more complicated, we did seize uh, the uh, tanker by ordering our factotums in Gibraltar uh, to seize it, and seize it they did, and we did so on a telephone call, one telephone call from one man, that one man was John Bolton, who is, of course, no more. But it's equally true that we released the tanker despite the 11th hour intervention of the United States government. The United States government demanded that we not release 
uh, the tanker, that we hand it over to them. Uh, and the British uh, judicial system in Gibraltar rejected that request and the tanker sailed on. And so far as I know, uh, it went actually to Syria and uh, discharged its cargo. The captain of the ship was offered millions of dollars in a bribe by text uh, by the United States government to uh, turn around and head somewhere else, deliver the ship and its cargo to the American government, allow it to be impounded somewhere else. Uh, but he, uh, extraordinarily, you might think, absolutely refused to do so, do anything so uh, dishonorable. So um, in the future, of course, we will have uh, a big fight in Britain over whether or not we have jumped out of the frying pan of the European Union into the fire of the United States. If I'm still breathing, I'll be a part of that fight. I didn't demand that we jump out of the frying pan in order that we jump in to the fire. I'll be fighting for an independent British foreign policy, a new role, entirely new role for Britain in the world. But at the end of the day, just like you in France, we'll get the government we vote for. If we vote for uh, a government that agrees with me, that's what we'll get. If we vote for a government that wants to be Donald Trump's poodle, uh, then, uh, then of course that's what we'll get. Nicholas, thanks uh, very much for that call. I want to take a quick break and then introduce my next guest, who is also an extremely interesting one. Let me take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, how could I resist my next guest? He's a Scotsman from Fife, just across the water from where I was born. And I mean a very narrow piece of water, the River Tay. He uh, came from Fife, but he now lives in uh, considerable style uh, near Las Vegas. How so? Uh, because he has become exceedingly rich, not at the gambling tables of Las Vegas, but by being the number one ethical hacker. You remember that Leonardo DiCaprio film uh, where uh, in the, uh, I think it's called Catch, Catch Me If You Can, where he ends up offering his tremendous hacking abilities to corporate America so that they can guard against people like him. Well, in a way, that's what Mark Litchfield does. He is a brilliant hacker, totally brilliant hacker. And he does so for ethical reasons. And he gets well paid for it. What's not to love? Mark Litchfield, are you there on the line, son? Yes, I am, sir. How are you doing? Which part of Fife are you from? Um, so I'm actually from our broth. From our broth, that's even better. It says Fife here. I used to go swimming in the yeah. outdoor swimming pool in our broth. Yeah, they shut that down a long time ago. It's very cold. It was very, very cold. I've even played football at Gayfield. Yeah. <laughs> I've even played football at Gayfield. So there you are. You're from our broth. So, so from our, how did you get, tell us, from our broth to Las Vegas? And what happened in between? Uh, okay, quick version. Yeah. Um, I went from my bro to London, did a job, set up a company with my brother, sold the first one, then we set up a second one, then we moved. Uh, I moved over to the U.S. because we were getting a lot of work from Microsoft. Set an office up over there. 
and then we got acquired and I came back to Scotland. Then I went back to Seattle. And from, well, I met my wife at that point. And because uh, I worked remotely, uh, she said, let's go to Vegas. I was like, okay, let's go. It's, very, it. it's, story, it's, certainly, right not, it's certainly not cold in the open air a swimming pool in Las Vegas. That's for sure. It must be the hottest place in America. Uh, right now, I have absolutely no idea what it is, but the sky is blue, <laughs> extremely blue, <laughs> and it's uh, very hot. <laughs> now, tell me about this ethical hacking. How did you get into that? Um, well, I started off the uh, traditional way, just teaching myself, and then, how can I put it? Um, I, I learned about this thing called Bug Bounty, and Yahoo um, launched this bug bounty program. And I thought, hey, let's give it a shot. So I did. And I found a bug. I submitted it. I just wanted to test the water, you know, see if this is all like legit. So I did and didn't hear anything back. Then six weeks later, I got an email from this company called Hacker One, who I'd never heard of at this point. And they said, hey, we've got like $2,700 for you. Do you want it? I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, damn, there could be money made in this. And it started from there. And how far has it gone? I mean, uh, do people come looking for your services? Well, uh, no, they don't. Um, and the reason why they don't have to, well, Actually, that's a lie. I have done it for uh, some companies, but uh, uh, it, Bug Bounty has grown so tremendously right now. To begin with, it was seen as like a fad. It was like a joke. But now there's so many companies involved in Bug Bounty that uh, you can literally go online and sign up to HackerOne Bug Crowd. There's a load of companies out there that are offering a lot of money if you can find like decent bugs there. Yeah, I mean, it's millions, yeah? 19 million uh, was awarded last year to ethical hackers like you. Yeah, and well, so I was at a live event where uh, Verizon Media paid out 1 million in one night. Okay. Well, I, ho I, hope you, I, ethical hack. I hope you got a decent share of it. Sure. Of course, for every ethical hacker, there'll be several unethical hackers, won't they? People who are effectively criminals. Uh, what's the ethical hacking community's attitude to the unethical? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. So the only way I would uh, turn this around is if you consider you have 1,000 white hats looking at a particular target versus one black hat looking at a target, and that black hat has already found a hole, these 1,000 other white hats will, have, will eventually find that one hole that the black hat found and then report it and get paid for finding that issue. And now you could essentially say the internet is safer and that black hat's hole is now being closed down. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about a black hat hole, I'm talking about um, a foreign state. Well, is, um, it, is, is it foreign states or is it thieves and, uh, and uh, the mischievous? Because they always try and blame it on a foreign state, don't they? But it's not always. It's, well, it it's often on private the, individuals. Yeah. Correct. Um, absolutely correct. But it depends on what the target is. So let's say it's Lockheed Martin. Now, if I was a foreign state, I would be going after not their database of customers. I'd be going after their research and development where they've spent billions of dollars. And now I can immediately steal that and... I've just got all that research, God knows how many years of research, and I instantly own it. Mm -hmm. So that would be a plastic China. Yeah. Then you have um, 
the other types of attacks, which is the ones you're referring to as the ransomware, but, but ransomware isn't really, that's not hacking, that's just sending like a link to someone's email where they click on it and they've basically exploited themselves. Okay, but what about all this malarkey of uh, interference in elections and so on? Uh, you're now in America. America has been, uh, mm -hmm. un until the Mueller uh, uh, died a death uh, a few months ago, the United States was entirely mm -hmm. fixated with the idea uh, that uh, Vladimir Putin had uh, hacked their election, but he didn't. Okay. I'm not going to proclaim to be an expert in this. Okay. Uh, I would suggest um, Alex Stamos would be a good person to talk to. Um, I know him. He's a great guy. Yeah. Put uh, him on. We'll, put him, the, we'll, uh, we'll put him the, on the show next week. So what's okay. like, what, he, uh, how, how does the future look for you, Mark? Uh, the future looks great. Are you going to stay there in the U.S.? I can't. Uh, yep. Um, actually, today I packed up my house. I'm moving. I'm going to Hawaii. Okay. I have to leave Vegas. Um, and I bought a bar. And I'm still going to keep hacking, doing what I do. You bought a bar well, in that's Hawaii? That's the life of a bug hunter. Yeah, I, I, can't, I get the keys on the 1st of October. I can't <laughs> tempt you back to our broth then. No chance. <laughs> God bless you and your wife. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for coming on the mother of all talk shows. You can call me, text me. You can even Skype me. But don't hack me. I'll be right back after this. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Try and get me some callers uh, up, please, when you can. Indy says, my heart is breaking for Assange. It feels as if he's forgotten. John Pilger said they're not even giving him his glasses. Please do something. We have surpassed Orwell, a political prisoner. It's a criminal, social, and human injustice. Where is the outrage? And D. Clark says, I'm not actually saying we should have a second vote. Oh, thanks. Thank that's good of you. Uh, I'm questioning who decides who can or can't change their minds. I'm sorry, Mr. Clark or Ms. Clark or they Clark. Uh, this misses entirely the point. You can change your mind. You can reverse 
the referendum decision, but not before it's been implemented. Don't you see? You can form a party, join a party, campaign for another referendum to rejoin the European Union. That is the democratic thing to do. Good luck to you. I don't think it will succeed, but it's a perfectly legitimate democratic campaign. What you're not entitled to do is tell those of us who've already won the referendum that you're not going to implement our, our verdict because that is to steal my votes. So implement our departure from the European Union and then, by all means, campaign to rejoin it. Euro, Euro army and all. Let's take the first call uh, for, uh, from uh, Glasgow, Sarkar in Glasgow. Sarkar, welcome. Hi, George. Good evening, mate. This is my third call. In fact, as usual, fantastic show, well, mate. that's good. Third call and 13 editions. That's not, not too many. Go ahead. <laughs> George, basically, it's a question with relations to the recent Hartlepool <coughs> council elections which happened. Okay. Now, the Brexit party have taken control of that council election and they have defeated an already sitting Labour party over there. Now, I don't know whether council elections would reflect a big deal at all if any general elections come up, but off late we have been reading in the newspaper that there's a Brexit and a Tory party pact to tap all the Brexit area voters. If at all this is the case, where does that leave Labour standing right now? Because... You, I don't know if you saw Emily Thornberry in Question Time two or three weeks ago. Not only did um, I see it, I dream about it. It's, it's, I mean, it's it, a recurring a nightmare. Show? Can I please ask you, I mean, I'm not being sarcastic, was that a comedy show, what she did? Because yeah. I thought Question Time should have been a serious one. Yeah. And George, one thing I must congratulate you, mate. Believe me, and I'm saying this as a Labour voter, or was a Labour voter, you have been right on 2001 Iraq and uh, Afghanistan invasion. You have been right in 2000 through Iraq invasion. What will happen? You told them way before. You were right in 1980s, people like you, Tony Benn, who said, don't sell arm to Middle East. No one listened to you. Mm. And you're also right now when you said that this could be the destruction of the Labour Party if they don't honour the referendum decision. You were also right in 2017 when Jeremy Corbyn won the highest ever vote seat share. At that time, I thought you were slightly wrong. I'm apologising for that because I did not believe when you said that thing that there are people in the Labour Party who don't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. But seeing what Tom Watson, what Emily Thornberry have been doing, believe me, George, it has been proved you were right again. Yeah, so I, was, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was wrong uh, once. I th 1978, I think it was. Or it might have been 1977. <laughs> I don't go but, back uh, that long. Sorry, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, I've been right on all the big things. Uh, um, and I, I, I frequently remind my wife uh, of my record of being right, but sometimes <laughs> she is hard to persuade. Um, well, look, it's not the case that there is a pact between the Brexit Party and the Conservative Party, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, if they don't make a pact, they will not win the election, okay. because uh, the Conservatives cannot capture many Labour constituencies yeah. in the Midlands and the North. It mm -hmm. is fanciful to believe that someone in uh, Scunthorpe or Hartlepool uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, or the South Wales Valleys is going mm -hmm. to embrace uh, the TOFs, uh, Jacob mm -hmm. Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson and so on. But they, they may very well embrace uh, the Brexit party and mm -hmm. Nigel Farage and indeed in all these kinds of places at the European Parliament elections uh, mm -hmm. earlier this year, they did embrace the mm -hmm. Brexit Party. That's why the Brexit Party won those elections and mm -hmm. Labour came fourth in those elections and a very mm -hmm. poor fourth at that. So um, if there is a pact, mm -hmm. then Farage and Johnson will win a big victory in the general election. If they don't make a pact, then, mm -hmm. as I said at the beginning, there's everything to play for because Labour will be on 20-something, the Tories mm -hmm. will be on 20-something, Brexit mm -hmm. will be around 20, Liberals will be around 20. So in each individual constituency, mm -hmm. anything can happen in a polity like that. And of course, okay. even more complicated in Wales and Scotland, where you have nationalist parties to be added uh, to that. 
Um, I saw Emily Thornberry. As I say, I dream of it every night. It's a recurring <laughs> nightmare. Uh, I don't know why she did not wish that the floor should open up and that she should slide into uh, out of view. But she seems to be very happy with her performance that <laughs> night because she's doubling down, doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling down on <laughs> the nonsensical Labour Party policy, which is for new listeners and viewers. If elected, <laughs> Labour will go to Brussels and renegotiate a Brexit deal, which now therefore becomes the Labour government's deal. Except all the okay. leaders of the Labour Party are going to campaign against it in a new referendum. They're going to campaign for Remain against their own deal that this they have just negotiated. And Jeremy Corbyn, as Prime Minister, is going to remain entirely neutral. And therefore, sure. to the public, Labour is going to renegotiate a deal and then campaign against it. Now, anyone who thinks that is a vote-winning policy <laughs> is either in Ward 5 at Broadmoor or has not read the opinion polls. The Liberal Democrats will get all these kind of voters. You will get hardly any of them, but you will lose five million, perhaps, of those Labour Leave voters who are determined that their vote in the referendum must be uh, honoured. Sarkar, don't be a stranger. Come back any week. Fra is in Belfast. Let's hear from him. Fra, welcome. Thank you very much, George. I must say I totally agree with your analysis there of what's happening with Brexit. Mm. But you did mention you did mention before recently about Venezuela and some of your callers were on about Iran. I've just returned from Damascus, the capital of Syria, which would be seen as another part of the uh, access of resistance. And I just wanted to take a few minutes uh, of your time, if that was possible, to give yes, you an update of what's happening on the ground. Go ahead, please. Thank you. George, I, I find the whole... Uh, the whole visit very inspiring. I was there for two days at the World Federation Trade Union Conference in Damascus, but also as part of that we got to visit uh, Malula, which is one of the towns that was held under ISIS control in there, 2013. Yeah. That's the yeah, holiest, well, it's the holiest place I've ever been, Fra. Yes, absolutely. It has the two. It has the chapel and it has the monastery. Uh, it has the, the, the statue of the Virgin Mary above the town. It has the bombed out hotel. Uh, it's just when I was there, George, people have this impression, uh, people that I know personally, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners, that, you know, Syria's under the cosh. Uh, you know, people are, are, are kind of living uh, through a living hell, which they are in many parts of the ISIS, Idlib, there is through part of... Uh, Syria, but 90% of the, the country is actually liberated. And when I was in uh, Malula, there were about seven busloads of pilgrims who had come from Lebanon. So it shows you how safe on some levels it is to travel from Lebanon through Syria unprotected to the oldest Aramaic Christian site in uh, Syria and indeed the world. And I also got to uh, travel in downtown Damascus unescorted to go around the bazaar in the souk. I saw uh, secular Syria uh, as a tolerant, vibrant and safe place for uh, people to go and visit. But I also had the, the, the pleasure and the honour of being uh, in a meeting with President Assad for two hours, along with uh, about 140 other delegates. I mean, there were, there were people from the Middle East trade union movements. These are presidents of the trade union movements. And Africa. There were people from North America and Canada, including journalists like Max uh, Blumenthal and Rania from the Grey Zone. They were both there. And to hear, George, what President Assad actually had to say, the more I listened to what he said about defending the Syrian Arab Republic from foreign imperialist aggression, it just struck me uh, very closely how much he seemed to resemble Chavez and Castro and people of that ilk who 
you know, have a, a socialist form of government that is there for the benefit of all the people of the nation that has been attacked by uh, foreign jihadi-led mercenaries in different countries uh, to try and destroy the country. So I just I found the whole experience very inspiring, and I wanted other people to know that, that Syria, 90% of the, the, the country has been regained, and the people are determined to liberate the rest of the country, including the Golan Heights at some stage going forward. Now, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions on that, Fra, and mm -hmm. thanks for the report. Um, are you saying that the centre of Damascus, you, you walked around it, you went mm -hmm. to the souk, uh, and a very wonderful uh, city, of course, and ancient city it is, and you, ha you had no security with you, and you didn't feel frightened at all? No, you just you just kind of encapsulated exactly how I felt on my visit. I, w I was there two years ago, and I was able to do exactly the same thing. It was just like you were at the hotel, and people said, the bus will be here in half an hour for anybody who wants to go sightseeing in the centre. You jumped on the bus, they dropped you off at the soup, which was close to the, I'm going to call it the Grand Mosque, I'm not too sure, but it it's is, where yeah. John it the is. Baptist. Yeah, yeah. John, John yeah, the Baptist I was in, is I was, there, yeah. Exactly, George. I was in the mosque. I walked around the souk. I bought some ice cream. I bought some like cigarettes and souvenirs to bring home. Uh, walked freely around the town. And actually, at, at one stage, we'd missed the bus because we weren't paying attention to the time. We just jumped in a taxi, which was a 20-minute ride, which was like $5. And, you know, you know two, two years ago, I think there were still bomb in Damascus from eastern Ghouta, uh from the suburbs. But this time, the, the country, including the trip to Malula, was very, very, very safe and secure. And That's I very felt very interesting. comfortable. And, and uh, finally, uh, the World Federation of Trade Unions, or WUF2 as we used to call it, uh, that uh, has been going for a very long time, and it's quite significant that they're holding WFTU conferences there. You'd never catch uh, the TUC or any of the British unions uh, represented at it, at least not yet. Were there any signs of, if you like, Western... Uh, trade unions beginning to go there and find facts? That's a great question. I'm very, very, very happy you've asked it because the answer to that is yes. There was one gentleman who was there as the head of one of the uh, trade union federations in Canada, and I wasn't officially representing the Canadian uh, trade union that he was the president of, but he was there in a fact-finding mission, and he was supposed to represent something like 3.2 million people. So the very fact that he's there means on some level the propaganda that we're all, we're all overwhelmed by and submerged with from, from the, the mainstream media is maybe those holes are starting to appear. But people like Max Blumenthal, I, I yeah. have to say, putting his, maybe his career on the line. Well, he's Max, been on uh, Twitter Max, and he's Max, very well. Max is a brave and brilliant writer, and uh, he'll tell the truth about all issues. I've got to take a break very quickly. I'll be right back. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrats of America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning and I'm looking for what's on the queue for today, I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. 
Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. All the breaking global, political, and economic news as it happens. Sputnik brings an all-star lineup with expert opinion from some of the biggest names in the news today. Noam Chomsky. Turkey, U.S. ally, now their main goal is to attack the Kurds, the one ground force opposing ISIS. And there have been a kind of a funnel for support of ISIS, not officially, but in practice. Peter Sunday, co-founder of the Pirate Bay. We don't have any sort of democratic control over the Internet. And I think that we're very naive when we think that the Internet itself is intrinsically good. It's not. It's just a very neutral technology that is being used for good things, but more and more being used for evil things. Icelandic Foreign Minister Gunnar Bragi Sveinsson. Increased activities in the Kepler air base, and that has to do with more um, activities from the Russian Northern Fleet in the ocean around Iceland, and also, of course, is usually flights of the bombers. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We're the ones that destroyed the government of Libya. We're the ones that putting in a pipeline dispute that helped destroy the government of Bashar Assad in Syria. We're the ones who invaded Iraq. Former U.S. Secretary of Defense William Perry. The hostile relationship between the United States and Russia today is dangerous for both countries, not because other countries would actually want to start a military conflict, but because there's always a danger of blundering. Sputnik talks to the brightest minds in politics and current affairs to find out what's really happening. Tune in. Listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Well, the first two hours are by, although you can catch them up as uh, thousands of people are doing. Right through the night, the numbers climb and climb and climb. Uh, you can, of course, catch up on Facebook, RT UK, and on my own YouTube channel, George Galloway Official. But there's still an hour of live broadcasting still to come. And what an hour it is. It's the mother of all talk shows with the cleverest man in England, Adam Gary. Adam, welcome back. I, uh, I uh, told the listeners and viewers earlier about uh, the road show that we did. <laughs> In, uh, in the West Midlands on Friday. Uh, our next one's in Liverpool uh, at the Liner Hotel. What's the, what's, uh, the I think date? It's on of the that? 19th of October, Saturday. Saturday. Saturday, the 19th of October. Uh, tickets are going like hot cake, so you better uh, get busy uh, and book them. Uh, so it's uh, Ticketmaster, I think. Anyway, it's the Liner Hotel in Liverpool. Uh, you really don't want to miss it. It will be Brian Travers of UB40, me, uh, Adam, and one of the hottest bands to come out of Britain over the last couple of years. And one or two very surprising guests. I'm not going to divulge even to Adam who those surprise guests are. They must remain a top secret. But my goodness, they are a top secret. We'll give you all the details before the hour is out, including how to get your tickets uh, for that. Uh, but Adam, I gave you notice of Ian Puddock's question, uh, but let's broaden it a little. On the face of it, Boris Johnson is heading for complete disaster. Uh, he appears set on a course uh, that cannot possibly prevail and could end in him going to prison. 
<laughs> maybe even next to Julian in, <laughs> uh, in Belmarsh, though I suspect they'd find a feather pillow for him. I think more Nawaz Sharif than Julian Assange. Yes. Not that it will happen. Yes. Um, so he must have something up his sleeve. Or he really is an idiot. Does he have something up his sleeve? What could it be? Well, he'd better have something up his sleeve. The issue in English law, which let's have a bit of that for a change, is a matter of parliamentary supremacy versus royal prerogative. Now, the short version of the difference between the two is as follows. If there's something that is singular and permanent, it is generally the charge of royal prerogative. If it's something ongoing and manifold, it tends to be the kind of thing dealt with by Parliament, an issue in which Parliament is supreme. For example, foreign affairs are generally the reserve of royal prerogative. That means the Queen and Parliament, which in the real world means the Prime Minister and the government, gets to make foreign treaties. The, the Parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords... Cannot make treaties. No. They didn't go to, the, to Versailles to end the Great War. And one of the areas that we can test where royal prerogative applies is this. There doesn't need to be an enforcement mechanism to end the war. Once the Great War is ended, you can't restart it. You can fight a second war, but you can't restart the first. Where for something like, let's say, if we have a hat tax, where anyone who wears a hat needs to pay a new tax, I shouldn't give any of these Don't people any ideas. ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but one would need to set up a mechanism uh, to enforce it and then to tax people like me who aren't wearing a hat to punish us if we refuse to pay. And so because it's an issue of foreign affairs, if this so-called called Ben Bill, and the irony of the author's surname shouldn't be lost on anyone since Mr. Hillary Ben's father, Tony Ben, was one of the great Brexiteers of all time, even though the term hadn't been invented. The legal argument that Johnson would have to deploy if it comes to a standoff in court is that the, the government, which is the, to say the Queen, cannot be bound by an act of Parliament in future foreign relations, because this would effectively bind the government from, it would prohibit the government from exercising certain rights and privileges that it has in making foreign treaties. And this would be a real showdown because both were open, the Queen is supreme but so is Parliament. Rarely do they clash but this could be the mother of all clashes. There wouldn't be much time uh, for uh, a crisis because we'll not know what Johnson is going to do until he goes to Brussels for the European Council meeting, I think it's on the 17th? Yes, 17th of uh, October. And uh, we're uh, ineluctably bound to leave, uh, absent any other mechanism, uh, on the 31st. So that's only 11, 14 days. That would require an epic Supreme Court battle to be done, dusted and adjudicated all within 14 days. And now the wheels of justice grind exceedingly fine, but they also grind exceedingly slow. Yes, quite right. And this Supreme Court, another ghastly invention of Tony Blair, mm. uh, who took away the power of the law lords to adjudicate in the same way, according to the common law, but in an existing ancient institution of parliament, it will be a matter of them perhaps having to decide ex post facto. He may well have already taken Britain out of the EU using his royal prerogative, prerogative um, as given to him by the Constitution, and then, having, then the court would have to decide in the aftermath of that. Getting back to the other question about EU law, it gets even more murky because EU law is a minefield and anyone who passes it gets a big kiss on the lips from Angela Merkel or Guy Verhofstadt or any of them in the EU. But there are two ways, and it's quite esoteric, but we're in esoteric times, legally speaking, two things that could be legally deployed for Johnson in his corner. The first would be the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty specifically states, and this is the EU constitution under a, under a, a, a yeah. misleading name. Yeah, yeah. It states they changed this name because it was defeated as a constitution. Quite right. In, in referenda. In, in referenda in more than one country. Indeed. And so rather than accept the vote, they just said, right, it's, it's the same document, but we're going to call it something that seems a bit less monolithic. In any case, that document says that with 
within two years from the day that a member of the EU decides to invoke Article 50 in order to prepare for a withdrawal, that country must withdraw from the Union. Therefore, Johnson could say, I must disobey the Ben Bill, which demands that the government asks for an extension, because that would be asking for something illegal. And it is perfectly right to refuse to obey legal orders. It might get you kicked out of the Labour Party, <laughs> but it would bode well for someone at the, Nuren, at the Nuremberg trials. Yeah. And so it's an, it's an esoteric argument in EU law, but he could make that without prejudice to what Mrs. May and the others have already done. Then there's a second issue which would invoke both European law and English common law. And that would be to say, since the European Council of Ministers is the forum in which Britain and the EU negotiate, it isn't for Parliament to interfere in that two-way relationship between one government and the 27 other governments. Do I think those EU law arguments will work? No, because the EU has a very clever way of disregarding its written constitution whenever it wants, a bit like what America unfortunately does. I think the arguments in English law about parliamentary supremacy versus royal prerogative and foreign affairs, that's going to be the crux of the issue unless some very clever government barrister can poke some specific holes in the Ben Bill, which would then, uh, it would take away the necessity of having to go to this constitutional argument. How very interesting. Uh, now, uh, I need to correct uh, the tickets for Liverpool are from uh, Ticket Quarter, although it says on that screen Ticket Quarter. Uh, <laughs> ticket Quarter. But this can all easily be resolved if my friends through the glass can bring me a piece of paper with the details, all the details of our Liverpool roadshow. Let's take our first caller though to Adam. It's James in London. James, welcome. Oh, hello, George. How are you? Good, thank you very much. Thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yeah, a very simple thing, and you know, you, you're certainly a certainly more learned and educated man than me. I just wanted to know why, when the media talks about Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, they talk about Marxism. Yeah. And why not? I mean, nobody seems to talk about Marxism. I mean, it's is there any reference historically where this kind of this, these kind of principles work? I think ben, is, is Venezuela not the most recent example of the, the disaster of these the principles? I just I, I, I look at these people as lunatics. I, 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 I think I, Jeremy I, Corbyn is an extremist. Really, I, I don't uh, actually think any of the three parties to whom you referred there are Marxist. I, I'm certain that Jeremy Corbyn is not a Marxist, and I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, John McDonnell, though he once was uh, one. Uh, is no longer. Uh, as to whether Venezuela is uh, guided by Marxism, again, I doubt that. I think that Venezuela is more southern than left. It's more Latin American than left. It's a bit like how they used to describe, you know, Vietnam and so on. Uh, Vietnam's struggle against the United States had nothing to do uh, initially with communism or, or Marxism. It was a struggle for national independence against a big power seeking to uh, subjugate it. And I think rather that Venezuela is in the same boat. Uh, neither do I believe that you're correct when you imply, infer, uh, that socialist politics is what has brought Venezuela low. What has brought Venezuela low is the determination of the United States to uh, destroy the Venezuelan revolution, which was, as you recall, uh, um, led by Hugo Chavez. But let me take more philosophically your, uh, your main point. Um, British, the British Labour Party has never been Marxist. It famously was said uh, that it owed more to Methodism than Marxism. And I think that Jeremy Corbyn is far more analogous to Michael Foote uh, than he is to uh, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, and by the way, on the Brexit issue, uh, Mr. Corbyn had identical views to Mr. Foote, but not because they were Marxist. Adam, pitch in. Well, I think the biggest problem with the Labour Party is its dysfunctionality. 
I'm, I'm totally anti-ideological myself. I don't have an ideology. I go with what works. I believe in pragmatism, and there's very, very little of that. Frankly, in either party, it's as if both parties are competing to see who can muck it up the most. But in general, we're living in one of the, in an age where cheap and easy rhetoric is flying everywhere. Yeah. So anyone to the right of Vladimir Lenin is called a Nazi, and anyone, uh, and anyone you know to the left of Tony Blair's right pinky finger is called a Marxist or a commie or, or the rest of it. I'm really not interested in any of these labels. If a politician is successful, it's because the economy grew rather than shrunk, employment increased rather than decreased, crime went down rather than up, war decreased rather than increased, terrorism decreased as well. These are all the kinds of tests I would use. So you look when there's an opposition party whose leader hasn't been in government before, you have to just ask, are these policies going to work, yes or no? I think Emily Thornbury gave the word, <laughs> gave the word that answer a few weeks ago. Uh, James, last word to you, my friend. James, are you still there? Oh, what a pity. Uh, James uh, did give you the right of reply. I'm sorry we lost you. Let's go to Louisiana in the United States. Talk to Patrick. Patrick, welcome back. Oh, it's great to hear your voices, gentlemen. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, thank you, thank you. I wanted to call about the uh, dastardly uh, love child of a walrus, otherwise known as uh, John Bolton. Um, <laughs> with, his with, his, with his departure, do you think that his replacement could potentially be just as bad, if not worse, than he? Or do you think Trump will pivot, possibly, and go in a different direction? Well, I, I mean, we'll ask Adam. Uh, he knows, uh, he follows these things a bit more closely than me. Uh, he even knows uh, this guy that wasn't in the Eagles, but is running uh, <laughs> for president against Trump. Um, but my view is that it would be hard to find someone worse than John Bolton, uh, number one. And number two, uh, that uh, Trump would be exceedingly foolish to go looking for one. Uh, it seems to me that uh, particularly the trade war actually that he's fighting with China is now beginning to hurt him electorally in quite a serious way. So he needs to de-escalate the foreign policy confrontations that he is now in. And uh, he cannot do that by appointing another John Bolton, Adam. Well, I agree with you. For you can't really get worse than John Bolton unless he appoints Tony Blair as his national security advisor and, appo and appoints John Bolton, the peace envoy to the <laughs> Middle East. But barring such a horrific Friday the 13th scenario, I think to quote Tony Blair's favorite song, things can only get better. Uh, I think that Trump has always been sincere when he's about big money rather than big war. He's about a golf war with a uh, with a, a with golf, a golf club, as opposed to as opposed to golfs of Tonkin and golfs of Persia and the rest of We're it. We're patenting that one. Uh, absolutely. Trump is more golf war than golf war. <laughs> it's a bit of a tongue twister, but you know the meaning uh, the meaning superlative. But yeah, I think that it'll be interesting to see who he picks. If it were me, I would put Senator Rand Paul in, the son of the greatest American president that never was, Dr. Ron Paul. But there have been other. There's a person called McGregor. His first name slips my mind, but he's given speeches that are very much in line with this non-interventionist, pragma pragmatic view that Trump has voiced. We'll know when we know, but there's also been voices that have said that the role of National Security Advisor might be reduced, as it frequently is. The most powerful in recent memory was, of course, Brzezinski, who guided Jimmy Carter's foreign policy very poorly, I might add. And then, of course, there was Henry Kissinger before him, who at one point was both Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. He was a very powerful fellow. I think what we'll see now is a reduction in the influence of that particular role and an increase in Pompeo's influence, which will make some people shudder, and I can understand why, but what all Pompeo is, he's a neocon because he can't really afford to be anything else. He hasn't got the creativity for peace, but he's a yes man, and at the end of the day, he wants to keep Trump happy. He wants to keep his job. He'll go along 
along with the flow. Where the walrus, John Bolton, swam against the current, and now he's been released back into his natural habitat, which is somewhere between an A-bomb and an H-bomb, I should think. <laughs> Brilliant. Patrick, last word to you. Well, I totally agree, Adam. I think I'm hoping that it, I'm hoping that it will be a non-interventionist like a, like a uh, Senator Rand Paul. Though you know, with this administration, you never know. So yep. I I certainly don't intend to get my hopes up. No, we'll not bet our houses on it, Patrick. Uh, that's if I had a house to bet. Patrick, thank you very much indeed for that call from Louisiana. Let's take a quick break, shall we? Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. On Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, tune in! Well, maybe mention, maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you're saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. They are. Everyone's crazy. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com. Global higher education with one of the world's best-known iconoclasts, the mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country. What's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us? Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Okay, here's the details of the road shows quickly. Saturday, the 19th of October, 7.30 p.m., the Linar Hotel in Liverpool. Tickets on sale at the Ticket Quarter website. Supporting me will be Brian Travers of UB40, Adam Gary, the cleverest man in England, and one of the hottest bands you're going to see uh, coming out of England over the next few years. They're called the Jade Assembly. Look them up, the Jade Assembly. And then in January, Saturday, 18th January, in East Kilbride, again, 7.30 start, and that's at the East Kilbride Village Theatre, and you get the tickets from the box office at the theatre, East Kilbride Village Theatre, Saturday, the 18th of January. Let's take a call from Tony in the aforementioned Liverpool. Tony, welcome. Good evening, George. Good evening, Adam. Evening. Um, How are you? I, I, my, my question is related to the, uh, the Brexit scenario still, George. I, I was just going to touch on the point 
Uh, we, 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 as far as I'm still aware, we do have a, a veto, um, and at the upcoming, the impending EU summit, yeah. can Boris Johnson, does he still have it within his power to use the veto, to actually veto the, the Ben bill? Uh, and at previous uh, EU summits, did Theresa May have that veto right herself? And did she just choose not to exercise that veto? Uh, well, it's a very good question. Of course, that could be the rabbit that he has up his sleeve. But there are two issues. Uh, first of all, you'll recall uh, on Theresa May's last hapless, ill-fated visit to negotiate with the EU, they kept her waiting outside, even eating outside. They, they made her dine alone uh, and sit outside while they were deliberating about us. They did not allow her into the room. Now, I suppose theoretically you could try and force a court judgment in Europe uh, that uh, granted us our right to be there and the use of our veto. But perhaps a larger problem is that if he did go to Brussels and do that, he would clearly uh, not just have ignored the Ben bill, I hate to call it that, uh, but he would have blown it up. He would have literally taken proactive steps to uh, contradict and destroy uh, what is now an act of parliament with royal assent. Adam. Well, if Emily Thornbury becomes a judge on the European Court of Justice, she then, will. then quite, you know, the pensions and all that, then perhaps Boris could veto his own request because Thornbury, of course, wants to veto her own negotiations should she ever get near power. Let's hope she does not, uh, speaking for myself only, though. Uh, most legal experts, though, agree that you can't veto something that you yourself have suggested. And the other legal argument in there is when you're giving a request, you don't really have any power over how that request is granted. You're asking someone else for something. You're not asking yourself to do something in the proactive sense. Frankly, what should have been done, if I were Boris Johnson, I would have called off the prorogation uh, and then made Parliament vote on a repeal of that act of constitutional vandalism created by the used car salesman Nick Clegg and his best buddy Dave Cameron called the Fixed Term Parliament yeah. Act. And if you repeal, you could repeal that with a simple majority. Not necessarily that easy for Boris to get, but far easier than the impossible three-fourths majority necessary to call a snap election under that act. If he were to muster that 50.1% of the parliament behind the repeal of that act, then he could just go to the Buckingham Palace and ask the Queen to dissolve the parliament like what uh, Justin Trudeau uh, just proverbially did uh, in Canada, or what Netanyahu did in Israel, or any other normal sense of parliament parliamentary a democracy that hasn't been destroyed by Dave and Nick. That's what I would have done. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. But I'll, I'll say something else, because I th think it's quickly worth saying. The biggest enemy to Brexit isn't the Lib Dems, it isn't Labour, it isn't the 20, the 21 who have been kicked out of the Tory party. It's Dominic Cummings, Boris Johnson's right-hand man, who's hated famously by people like Gina Miller and John Major, but he's also someone who's said incredibly not things about the true architect of Brexit, Nigel Farage. He was one who was a soft Brexiteer from the beginning, and he's someone who's openly pro, well, uh, not openly, but he is prohibiting this uh, Brexit alliance between all MPs and all parties who support Brexit, which nominally would be the Brexit party of Farage, the Conservative party of Johnson, and people like Kate Hoey on the Labour side, like others on the left centre, and those who previously had no affiliation. Cummings, is an egotist, and I really think because of that he's giving Boris some very bad uh, suggestions, and the proof is in the pudding. Things are looking bad. The brilliant plan has backfired spectacularly. No, it's in court on Tuesday, isn't it? I believe so, yes. In the Supreme Court. Not this issue, but the other, the prorogation issue prorogation. will be in court on Tuesday, Why did yes. he bother with prorogation? Because the Parliament has done its worst anyway. Quite in so. the time it had available left. He's getting really bad advice. If he was going to prorogue Parliament, just prorogue it through the 31st. But he didn't do that. He gave them enough time to sabotage what he wanted, but not enough time to do what I would have done, which is to try to attain a simple parliamentary majority to throw out the Fixed Term Parliaments Act that would let him then dissolve Parliament and call an election. You know, in this very building, uh, Peter Mandelson, <laughs> uh, 
set about the modernization of the Labour Party. I was in favour of modernising the method, uh, <laughs> just not modernising the content. Yes. Uh, but the modernization of the method was very impressive. I know that because I was a Labour Party official under Michael Foote and I was a Labour Party uh, member of Parliament uh, when these people came to power. So I could see, compare and contrast. Now in this very building, Mandelson and Co would have considered it anathema. Someone would have been fired for allowing the Prime Minister to approach a fortune teller on a seafront <laughs> with cameras in tow, without knowing what the fortune teller was going to say. Even cross her palm with silver uh, in order that she doesn't embarrass you. But she utterly humiliated Johnson. Who's running that show, I asked myself today. I mean, if it were if it were Mandelson and Campbell in charge, it would have probably planted someone, dressed them up dressed like up a gypsy, a and teller. then say, "Well, I think that Mr. Blair is modernising the country, and I think he's the greatest thing since a sliced crystal ball." And you know, this whole thing it is looking a bit chaotic. It makes the the, the early months, uh, and mind you, that was even more chaotic than now. The early months of the Donald Trump White House looked like the Politburo of the Communist Party of Compared China. Compared to this, yeah, it's really. And I personally, I. I I'll, I'll lay my own cards on the line. I don't like Cummings because I don't like his views about Brexit that he expressed in 2016. I don't like how he's attacking the golden goose of Brexit, which love him or hate him, is Nigel Farage. And just look at what's going If this is your great, brilliant strategist, if this is your Rasputin, then he's not really doing, doing much good, whether it's the fortune teller or whether it's lacking the very foresight to realize that if you give Parliament a few days before prorogation, they're not just going to sit there praising John Burko. They'll do that, but they did other things too. Exactly. So, Tony, thanks for the call. Max is in Surrey. He's on next. Go ahead, Max. Uh, good evening, John. Um, good to do your great show again. Thank I think you. you should be on more often, actually. But um, yeah. it's the same, I miss you sometimes. <laughs> Uh, quick, quick question. Um, so, in India, they recently. Uh, remove the status for uh, a million people to be, to be Indian citizens. And this particular policy uh, disproportionately affects the, the Muslim population. Um, so that's been going on for a while, and the official register now has removed uh, approximately about a million people. Today, I was reading on RT that Modi is opening a, a, a concentration camp for non-citizens. I was curious um, what Adam thinks will be the crunch point for some kind of international intervention, because the current Hindu party is becoming the Nazi party. Well, uh, um, of course, uh, Adam will answer for himself, but let me be absolutely clear. Uh, armed intervention against India is not going to happen, should not happen, would be catastrophic were it to happen. Uh, I, I am, I'm not in second place to anyone in my feelings about Mr. Modi. Uh, but at the end of the day, India is an independent country. Uh, it, uh, it has a government that was re-elected with an increased majority very recently. And unfortunately, it's using that parliamentary power uh, to really cut a swathe through all that was good uh, about India in the past. Adam, you're an expert on India. Give us your view. Well, I'm in 100 percent agreement with that. I think that the BJP, Modi's party, it's an absolute abomination, but it's only going to fall from within. He's had some scandals, but that didn't affect the election for the reasons that you just explained. But India is fast becoming a prison of nations, which was, of course, the term that was used about the Soviet Union uh, in the 70s and 80s. And before that, Lenin actually said that about Russia. Lenin was, of course, very wrong. Russia was never a prison of nations. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, well, we'll leave that for another day. Um, but India's becoming a place where a, a northern clique, so states like Uttar Pradesh, 
states like Gujarat, this so-called cow belt, the Hindi belt, is essentially creating a several apartheid within one. Sikhs are being suppressed. Assamese are being suppressed. The entire South is essentially being ignored and treated like a foreign country. And Muslims are being attacked outrageously in, in India proper, which is to say nothing about the occupation turned violent annexation of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Dalits, low-cost Indians, are being treated horribly. And if the economy for the middle-class people who are thus far ignored these issues around the social periphery, which in India is larger than the center, if we're talking about economics, once the economy starts to have a downturn, and I believe over the next year, year and a half it will, and once people get increasingly fed up and agitated, we're going to see a lot of internal strife. And one thing to look out for specifically is next year in 2020, the Sikhs of Indian Punjab are set to hold a referendum, democratic, peaceful referendum on self-determination, just as the Scots have the right to do, just as the Catalans should have the right to do, just as anyone in the world should have the right to do. If India crushes that referendum under the force of violence, we're going to see, I think, much more consternation and many more challenges to the hegemony of the BJP from within than we've previously seen. Thanks, uh, Max, for the call. Vincent is in South Wales. Go ahead, uh, Vincent. Yeah, thank you very much, George. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, agree with Adam in respect to... Can you turn, turn your radio stuff. down, Vincent, yeah? Turn your radio down, because we're getting feedback. OK, sorry about that, right. OK, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Anyway, I agree in principle with... Which um, Adam on this, and that is uh, the three points. Can we uh, stop this one because uh, it's impossible? Uh, we're hearing it. Uh, we're hearing everything twice. Uh, try and get back to Vincent uh, if you can, and talk him through the need to turn your uh, radio down. Uh, so the telephone number uh, for people is if you're in the UK, 02077 982255. And if you're in the U.S., 001-757-744-4480. Uh, lots of uh, Twitter questions for you, uh, Adam. Um, Marie McFarlane, my old friend Frequent up in listener. Scotland, says, Adam, what do you think of the recent dumping of Boeing by China and its return to the gold standard in replacing the dollar? Well, first of all, China has not gone on the gold standard at all. What they are doing it's is they're buying gold. gold and lots of it, which could just be a long-term, and I mean very long-term, preparation for one day going on the gold standard. But right now, America is China's best customer. If China starts selling in gold and America starts buying it in its monopoly money painted on that green paper, <laughs> that's not good for either side. But China's looking to the long-term. China has a very un hysterical culture, which is one of the reasons I'm a great admirer of it. Uh, back to the Boeing issue, uh, there's more to that than meets the eye. Right now, the trade war has gone from stick mode into carrot mode. The Chinese have started to buy more U.S. agricultural products as a gesture of goodwill, and Trump has reciprocated by delaying the onset of further tariffs, which if the next few rounds of trade talks go well, may, I stress may, not even be necessary. The Boeing thing is a sword with two ends. On the one hand, there are very serious concerns about this Boeing 737 MAX jet that has had multiple fatal crashes in a very short period of time. I personally wouldn't get on one of those planes mm -hmm. if asked to do so at an airport. Uh, so there's the safety issue, which is very real, and China's in the capacity to buy planes from whomever they want. They're the second richest country in the world going on the first. Then there's the subtext. If a trade deal is done, China can then say, well, look, if you don't want to give us a good deal, we're going to go to Monsieur Macron and, her, and uh, Frau Merkel uh, and talk about uh, Airbus purchases. But as part of the trade deal, Boeing could get rehabilitated, so to speak, in the Chinese market. So there's a lot going on there. Boeing's down, not necessarily out not for necessarily good. Out. Vincent uh, is back on the line from South Wales. Go ahead, Vincent. 
Yeah, thank you very much, George. Uh, yeah, in relation to no deal at the end of October, I think there are three key points that may well be in the quiver of Boris's English bow. The first one is that EU law is considered a higher status than UK law whilst we are a member of the EU. The second point is the royal prerogative is important and relative in respect to foreign treaties stroke Article 50. And the third point is the Bill of Rights 1689 within our common law constitution is still law in the land and these three factors can be used to combat the coup in Parliament through the Hillary Benn Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Adam, you've dealt with one of those points already, the yeah. prerogative one, but the other two? Well, uh, sadly, EU law is superior to UK law. That's, that's one, one of the, the reasons that's Brexit what, is that's important. one of the reasons why we voted to leave. I'd like a bit of English law back. Uh, call me old-fashioned. I think the common law served very well from the time of Hastings up to 1973 when Mr Heath fiddled about on his organ. Uh, sorry, Mr Heath. But uh, getting, getting back to the third point, again, I, I'm, I'm roasting David Cameron because his... Uh, his his uh, book is out. His, his book is out, available at all good pictures. Big stars we'll, land review over. It, we'll review it next week if we can. <laughs> Quite so. He's, David Cameron, the Norfolk pig farmer. Indeed. And he was saying when he was Prime Minister that we need a Bill of Rights in this country. There is one. <laughs> Mm. So I don't know if the man was just stupid or pig-headed or what. Pig-headed? Um, <laughs> Wouldn't but, mention pig-heads and David Cameron <laughs> in the same radio broadcast. <laughs> Not live, at least. Go ahead. Well, I think we're into the quadruple entendre territory now. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the Bill of Rights gives certain privileges of representation to the people. It, it, it promoted the idea that one can petition Parliament. And this was an age before universal suffrage, but the foundations of being of having a parliament representative of the people as opposed to one that simply follows some foreign diktat or some royal diktat it's all in there and it's very important and it should be invoked uh, it will be invoked I'm sure if this goes before the Supreme Court uh, which it will but then there's this other question that is far more banal than all this high-minded talk of constitutionality Boris keeps talking about wanting a deal. And when he says a deal, he doesn't mean the straightforward free trading agreement that I want, that I think you want, uh, that Mr. Farage wants, that most people on the Brexit side would want, that maybe even Tony Benton would have wanted. You know, I can't speak for him. He wasn't necessarily a big exponent of free trade, but nor was he one of these stupid isolationists. He knew all about the 1930s and the economic stupidity there on all sides. Um, if Boris tries to ram May's bill through Parliament by reheating it minus the backstop and it passes. Or, or with a backstop called something else. Quite right, that's, that's very possible. Then we could see a betrayal not of the Constitution, not of questions of royal prerogative versus parliamentary sovereignty, but we could have Brino, Brexit in name only. And then there's the other complicated issue. If the EU agreed to such a bad deal and Boris tries to get it through Parliament and it fails, then we're sort of back to square one with a standard off between royal prerogative it would and the likely rest of it. fail wouldn't it because the GUP so. uh, would not support it the hardline half of the ERG uh, wouldn't support it labor and liberal and nationalists wouldn't support it mm. because because they don't want uh, they don't want any kind of brexit or you think they might cross the floor I mean, not for me to call them dishonest and hypocritical, <laughs> but I think... Liberal I... Democrats. <laughs> well, how dishonest. many... I mean, most people who were in the party weren't even in the party a few months ago. They've got more Tory MPs than they have Liberal Democrat <laughs> MPs it, now it, sitting in the Liberal Democrats. I mean, the whole thing is so surreal. They've got a guy now who, three, four weeks ago, was running to be the leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> He's now a Liberal Democrat <laughs> MP. How many MPs in the British Parliament today uh, are uh, in the same party they were when they were elected to the British Parliament just two years ago? 
It's I, extraordinary. I, mean, I don't know the number, but I've lost count of it. I mean, the Liberal Democrats have become so green, they're recycling members of Parliament now. <laughs> uh, but so getting back, I agree with, I certainly think that the ERG, at least most of them, this hardline Brexit faction of the Tory party, that without whom Johnson couldn't govern at all, mm. uh, they, they would reject it. Um, I would think that uh, some Labour would reject it, s most Liberals would reject it, the Nationalists would reject it, but if enough Labour MPs jumped on board as a way to get this out of the way so they could safely throw Corbyn off the Titanic before anyone's looking, they could vote for this Brino deal. Well, they, they had plenty of chances to do it. They had three chances to do it, and there was never uh, more than a dozen of them, mm -hmm. usually seven, eight, nine of them, uh, voted for Theresa May's uh, deal. Uh, it depends. Do they hate Corbyn more than they hate the Theresa May deal? Uh, do they uh, want Tom Watson to be their uh, leader? Do they want uh, John McDonnell to be their leader? Uh, uh, there are all kinds of variables. Quite so. But let's take a quick break and we'll return to them. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this to the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video and I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. We are talking... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Only on Sputnik Radio. Well, I did tell you that uh, legends trump everyone else. And there's a legend on the line. It's the legend that is Norma in Bristol. Norma, Hello. welcome back to the show. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, George. Hello, Adam. Good evening, Norma. Um... Actually, I just wanted to say it was so sad that John shipped an interview it was, with Julian yeah. Fat. Yeah, yeah, but it was really, well, it, I thought it was unbelievable. Yeah. But my contribute, I've still got an echo. No, you're, you're <laughs> addressing the world now. It's no longer just the country. There's people all over the world listening to you right now beautifully. Well, I am an, I'm an internationalist. Yeah. My contribution seems to pay into significance, really, from that. John Shipton won, but no. I wanted to ask Adam, uh, last night of the proms, uh, they have some lovely programmes throughout the season, but the last 45 minutes, I never watched, I just put it on and switch off, it upsets me because they have Royal Britannia, um, and then you have the lovely music of Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance, but I hate the Land of hope and glory, and my dear, yes, I'm my dear. And uh, do we really need the national anthem? And then they pop balloons in the audience when the music's going on, which is bad mannered. All I liked was Old Lang Syne at the end. I just wondered what Adam thought. Yeah, uh, well, uh, you know, I think Land of Hope and Glory is the most glorious and beautiful tune 
Um, oh, cute. If, yeah, if we were to Definitely. make it, if we were to make it our national anthem, we'd need to change the words. Exactly. Uh, but the tune itself is sublime, Beautiful. I think. Yeah. Uh, Adam, over to you. It's your uh, your field more than mine. Well, um, I think that Elgar's uh, Pomp and Circumstance March and the lyrics of Land and Hope and Glory are fine, just the way they are. There's actually Vera Lynn sings it beautifully. That's you can see that online. I, I love no, all the all the musical compositions. I have no problem with at all. I think they're great. The problem I had with the last night of the proms last night uh, was that provocateurs passed out for free EU flags to just about everyone in the audience. Why was that allowed? I mean, they knew it was going to happen. Yep. It's happened every year for the last few. And not only was it allowed, but the BBC cameras never stopped focusing on them. There was even one man who appeared to, who appeared to be carrying with him a balloon phallus capped with some sort of EU insignia. Disgraceful, frankly. And I just thought, on a night that's supposed to be about a national celebration with uh, British composers and international audiences, I don't have any problem with people bringing flags from all over the world, as they always have, because that's what New Music's about. Music's about sharing one culture with another and then seeing where it goes after that. That's absolutely wonderful. But to bring an overtly political uh, uh, symbol, for example, if there was someone carrying a Brexit Party flag or a UKIP flag or a Labour flag or a Tory flag, that would have been considered controversial. The EU flag, though, is a political symbol, especially That's with what's now, going yeah. on right now. Mm. And I just think that was disgraceful. But the music itself, uh, give me Elgar and Rule Britannia over the more modern stuff any day. Uh, Norma, yeah, last word to you. It's just, I, I'm an internationalist. I like music from all over the world. Same I don't here. like pushing our country up like Rule Britannia and Mightier Yet and Mightier. I don't like all it. All countries have songs that talk about how great yes. they are. But that's, we can be international in our musical taste, which I certainly am, and still respect that all countries talk about their own real or perceived greatness in yeah. their national music. And, of course, we, we could have gone out with John Lennon, a working-class hero from our own land. Uh, he could have, uh, we could have gone out with him singing, all we are saying is give peace a chance. Um, now... Mind you, Ringo wouldn't have been uh, popular there. I forgot about <laughs> our controversy on Ringo. They were trying oh, to yes. drum him <clears throat> out of the brownies <laughs> uh, this week. week. Thanks, Norma. Uh, last call, I think, will be from Heath in Daytona Beach. Go ahead, Heath. Daytona Beach is in California, I'm guessing. No, Florida. No, <laughs> no. It's, it's Florida. It's warm. It's sunny anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, George. So um, I just wanted to make the comment that um, people are consistently saying, politicians and, and mainstream media, that everybody is tired of Brexit and they're tired of not getting forward. And I, I just wanted to put out there that I disagree with that. I'm highly active on Twitter and Facebook and other social media. And I've, I believe that people are more engaged in democracy than at any time that I've been alive. And I think that the next stage of this, having watched the, the Brexit constituency win the argument consistently, that we need more democracy, not less. Oh, yeah. And I would like to know your thoughts on um, making the case for the next referendum that we need in the United Kingdom is to move our political system towards a proportional representation system. Well, I've supported that all my life, even when I was the beneficiary of its alternative, its undemocratic alternative, which is the voting system that we now have. I personally lobbied both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown when they had the power and the majority to do so, to introduce proportional representation. Uh, which is fair votes, fair representation. Um, and that was uh, when I would not myself have benefited from it. So clearly, now that I would benefit from it, I'm uh, just as enthusiastic uh, about it. It is entirely wrong uh, that a party uh, that I wouldn't have voted for ever, uh, UKIP, uh, can get millions of votes uh, but no MPs. Uh, and a party that uh, gets uh, 
um, 30 percent or less of the popular vote in the country could end up with a parliamentary majority depending on how the chips fall. Uh, so I have uh, an old-fashioned view uh, which is that the parliament should directly reflect the proportion of votes cast in the country. That would place me um, on the Israeli side of the proportional representation system. But there are other systems. Other systems are available. There's the one in Scotland, the additional member system. There's the De Haunt system by which our delegation to the European Parliament uh, is elected. But I prefer pure proportional representation. If you get 10% of the votes in the country, you should get precisely 10% of the seats in the Parliament. Adam, over to you. Yeah, I, I agree. I believe in proportional representation. There's nothing sacred about the way in which MPs are elected, which a lot of people don't get. It changed in a bigly way, to quote Trump, in 1832, again in 1867, again in the 1880s, then 1918, and even as recently as the Attlee government, when the loss of the multi-member uh, MP constituencies yeah. were abolished. It's and constantly evolving. So uh, can I just say, I quite like the way that the EU Parliament gets elected with their proportional representation. You like how the Israeli parliament gets elected. So I think I'm going to have to ring one of the tabloids because for the first time in history, I'm agreeing with something to do with the European Union and you're agreeing with something to do with Israel. <laughs> but so oh, we're generally in agreement though on yeah, that. Yeah. But getting to the other point, um, I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of more democracy, more, more referenda and more free speech. I can't stress that enough. But I think that uh, our friend calling in might be a bit overly optimistic. In a traditional totalitarian or oligarchic state, free speech is silenced the old-fashioned way, under a jackboot, in the gulag. What we have here is people are generally allowed to talk and talk on Facebook and Twitter and the rest of it. Until but people start li listening to them. Indeed. And they won't let them get near the elites. And there is a change in the air. The winds of change are blowing. But the old liberal elite aren't gone yet. So I think we need to remember that while Twitter and Facebook are a good way to get voices heard, it's still a digital make-believe world. If that doesn't translate into the ballot box and into the wider uh, parliament of ideas in society, then it's more of a sideshow than anything else. Last word quickly to you, Heath. Uh, I think if we have more of the proportional representation, we will lose these hyper hyperbolic campaigns that target one or two or ten marginal constituencies yeah, that yeah, swing elections. Yeah, yeah, what quite so. Do, and that is a very negative uh, thing. Thanks for that call uh, from Florida, from, I infer, an Englishman about the UK's uh, voting system, which tells you something about this mother of all talk shows. Clever people uh, are listening to us all over the world. It really is a global university, and I'm grateful to everyone that called in everyone that uh, uh, sent in tweets and other messages. I'm sorry if we didn't get to uh, yours. Uh, but the good news is uh, we'll be back here, God willing, at the same time, same place next week. Uh, a number of people are asking why can't we do more uh, of these uh, shows. We're very grateful to RT and to Sputnik for the show that we have. It's a big operation. Uh, it's quite an expensive uh, operation, much more big and much more expensive than the old inferior local radio versions of the show. So I wouldn't dream of asking them uh, to do it all again midway uh, through the week, for example. But there are breaking news stories often uh, that I uh, would like to comment on. And I do a short four-minute video for RT every Monday, which comes out uh, on a Tuesday. I also do uh, a weekly column for RT.com, which I write on a Tuesday and which is published uh, on uh, a Wednesday. Uh, so there are plenty of opportunities on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, to keep abreast of what I'm saying, what I'm thinking, and you can follow both Adam and me on Twitter and, uh, in my case, on Facebook and on uh, Instagram even, Snapchat even. Or even better, you can come to our live shows. There's really something I must tell you. 
Liverpool, Saturday the 19th of October, and East Kilbride in Scotland. Not often I speak in Scotland now, so if you're listening in Scotland, uh, wherever you are, be prepared to travel to East Kilbride for what I think will be uh, a terrific night. So it's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. My thanks to all my friends through the glass. Uh, busy uh, like a beehive it is, <laughs> uh, with uh, very clever young people doing their very best to bring you what I think is the best show on radio. It's must-see radio. Spread the word, won't you, about it. So, been marvellous for me. Hope it was for you. Until I see you again next week, good night. This is Radio Sputnik. Sputnik has been launched to give you a closer look at everything happening in the world. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tough questions are the most powerful weapon we have. As long as you have questions, we'll keep asking. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold.